So welcome everyone. This is the HCA 2022 Latin American Symposium. This is uh, the second symposium that we are um, uh, participating, uh, creating with focus in uh, Latin America. Uh, I would like first to introduce to you my colleagues who, who are here uh, uh, together with me on the side. So Enrique Hernandez from Mexico, Yesid from Colombia, and Vinicius uh, from uh, talking from Chile. Um, and also I would like to uh, thank the uh, organizing committee from the Human Cell Atlas. They've been together with us since 2020, helping us a lot organizing uh, these meetings. So especially Christine, Tracy, John, and Samantha. Our organizing committee um, um, puts together then four countries from Latin America. The idea is always to expand the members from this region and to participate in HCA and to work with these new technologies of single cell analysis. And I would also like to thank um, uh, the administration support we had from uh, especially Elena and Laura, also Juliet and Romario. There are students also from Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, and Brazil. And the support from two consortiums that are currently funded by the CZI, Latin Cells, and the Project Jaguar. We are members of these consortiums, and we have been working together uh, in new projects. We got together in the first meeting um, two years ago, 2020. We got to know each other then, and the idea of this meeting is to foster more collaboration in Latin America between new groups, new researchers that would like to join us in this um, idea. Also to spread and mostly to spread the mission of the Human Cell Atlas so we can collaborate in projects that can uh, support this uh, mission. So who is here today to this meeting? We are very happy to have members from 36 different countries all over the world and to have um, a lot of uh, researchers and students joining us from Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Peru, and Argentina. You can see here in this chat that we put together here, uh, the idea is to um, have more and more uh, researchers from Latin America joining HCA meetings in the near future. And we hope that this meeting is going to um, help everybody uh, in these discussions and how to manage that in the near future. For that reason, we put together some breakout sessions later today and also later tomorrow. Join us in that. The idea is to understand who is willing to uh, participate in these projects, who is willing to join us in, um, in these ideas, in these uh, new technologies. Uh, we will be discussing bottlenecks, current projects that are being developed. And uh, it's an opportunity for you to get to know people from not only Latin America, but also other countries that join us and uh, foster uh, collaboration. Uh, we, this is a, an overview of our agenda of today. So we're going to have a very diverse set of uh, talks, uh, starting with Parta, and then uh, Andres, Mariana, Leonardo, and Helder for the three first, uh, uh, for the, this uh, first uh, sessions, I'm going to be uh, moderating together with Enrique. Then we're gonna have a lunch break, coffee break, depending when, of when, where you are. And then lightning talks. Join us for the lightning talks. We made an effort to get students and postdocs uh, working in the region in Latin America or Latin Americans working abroad so they can share what they're doing. And after that is when we're gonna have our breakout sessions for the discussions, both today and tomorrow. So if you, you would like to watch the meeting in Spanish, you may do so by clicking the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen and then selecting ES for Spanish. So we're all trying to speak uh, slowly, because there are translators working on what we are um, saying here, reporting here. Uh, the plenary sessions of the meeting are being recorded, and they will be available later on at the channels, HCA YouTube and Bilibili sites after the meeting. But the breakout sessions are not going to be recorded. 
And if you want to ask questions, please type into the chat box in Zoom. I think by now everybody's pretty much used to working with Zoom, so uh, work as always, right? And you can ask your questions in Spanish or English and even Portuguese, right? So both uh, me, Yesid, and Vinicius, we speak Portuguese, so we can translate also the questions when necessary. And we will do our best to address all questions. If we don't, please um, uh, write them again over there so that we can see it, you know? Uh, but we are hoping we're all gonna have a great meeting. Uh, here is the link. If you haven't joined the registry of HCA, you can uh, join them later. Um, take a look at, at everything they are already doing. And welcome you all. So our first speaker of the day is our dearest uh, Partha Majumber. He has made significant contributions to human statistical and population genetics and genomics. He has developed methodologies for mapping human disease genes, uh, identified genomic factors underlying many diseases, notably uh, oral cancer that he will be speaking about a little, and has reconstructed the ancestries and relationships of populations, groups of India and Asia using genomic methods and tools. He is a member of the organizing committees of the International Human Atlas Consortium and the International Common Disease Alliance. He has served as the Indian National Coordinator of the International Cancer Genome Consortium. He has provided service both to the UNESCO and the WHO. For his uh, contributions to science, he was selected as a National Science Chair by the Government of India. He has established the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics in India and is currently a distinguished professor in the Institute. He is also an emeritus professor of the Indian Statistical Institute. He's a recipient of the Berkeley Memorial Medal of the Asiatic Society, Biology Prize of the World Academy of Sciences, Golden Jubilee Co uh, Commemoration Medal of the Indian National Science Academy, among many others. So, Bartha, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Patricia. That was a very kind introduction. Um, it's indeed a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for uh, asking me to give this talk. Uh, let me share my screen. I'll try and speak slowly because I understand that uh, uh, interpreters are working behind the screen. Um, so let me let me first share my screen. All right, so um, the title of my talk is, uh, is slightly long. Um, it's a, 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 I'm going to talk to you about some of the commitments and activities of the Human Cell Atlas uh, that's meant to promote equity, which is uh, something very important. And uh, an equity working group was formed early on um, in the HCA. And I'm also going to share with you some results of our work, uh, single cell transcriptomics work, um, on a specific disease, on a specific disease, which is oral cancer. So one of the clearest messages from genomic studies is that uh, most diseases, uh, or at least many diseases, are much more heterogeneous at the cellular and molecular levels than was originally um, recognized. And this, this uh, heterogeneity impacts on clinical outcome of these diseases uh, that in turn uh, impacts on management of these diseases, response to treatment and survival of individuals who have these diseases. So heterogeneity ha impacts on various kinds of uh, outcomes uh, and impacts on management of diseases. We therefore must understand heterogeneity at the molecular level. At this time, for most diseases, uh, uniform therapy is prescribed. Uh, that is the same treatment uh, is prescribed for all patients. And the goal is to be able to risk stratify based on molecular understanding of these various kinds of diseases, to be able to risk stratify uh, the screening and uh, eventually the treatment for these diseases. There will be, uh, if these are risk stratified, there will be reduction of overdiagnosis of these diseases. And then if the treatment is uh, tied to the genomes, then there'll be more personalized interventions for these diseases. All of this, we believe, will save uh, expenditure on treatment 
and overall increase in the number of years of disease-free survival. Uh, so essentially, that's uh, that's what uh, the um, uh, human cell atlas is uh, intending to do. But to be able to do, to be able to understand diseases, one needs to understand normal health because, after all, uh, normal health is perturbed uh, in 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 these uh, in in precipitation of these various kinds of diseases, and therefore, uh, initial uh, initial uh, focus or initial emphasis is essentially to understand. Um, the normal human body. Uh, precision genomics is what we've been talking about, uh, understanding diseases at the molecular level, tailor making these kinds of uh, understanding to treatment, therapy, etc. Uh, now, uh, has that actually penetrated into the society? And is it uh, uh, penetrated and is it significant in some ways to promote health equity? Right now, as we know that. Uh, you know, health uh, management, health dissemination is not very equitable. And uh, what, what we believe is that if there is pen penetration of precision genomics, it will promote uh, health equity. Uh, this penetration has not happened yet uh, because the understanding is, uh, is happening just now. And therefore, the penetration has uh, will take some time, but the penetration has begun. Um, the, uh, in terms of precision gen genomics, uh, currently the pinnacle of uh, precision genomics is the human cell atlas, uh, which essentially tries to understand or define human body cell by cell. Every human cell is being defined in terms of its uh, expression of genes and what it does, function, etc. That uh, is leading to an understanding of human biology. And it's uh, like I said, that it's a perturbation of human biology, of human physiology that uh, eventually leads to precipitation of various kinds of diseases. Uh, the information that's, that's being generated uh, in the various human cell atlas projects uh, will eventually enable better disease management. And again, I know at the risk of repetition, I'm going to uh, you know, state that it will save on uh, cost of treatment, it will reduce patient suffering. It will reduce anxiety of family members because it's no longer across the board treatment. It's more precise. And we hope that it will increase patient survival. Um, these health benefits uh, needs to accrue across geography, ethnicity, gender, and age. And um, uh, the Human Cell Atlas is actually trying to promote and ensure that. And uh, that's what we believe uh, is equity. Uh, in, in, in this particular sector of human health. The, uh, if I just can take one, one uh, single uh, disease, which is our one single perturbation of human health, which leads to cancers, the kind of questions in cancer biology that's being addressed by the emerging uh, technology, which is single cell RNA sequencing, uh, essentially starts, uh, well, we uh, had a, the understanding was to figure out, you know, what proportion of uh, individuals who are suffering from these various cancers are predominantly because of genetic causes or non-genetic causes and the interaction between the two. Uh, that, that has been fairly well understood. Uh, the various kinds of microenvironmental cues and cell-cell interactions are being understood uh, and, and so on and so forth, recurrence of disease, etc. Uh, the human cell atlas essentially is trying to understand the cell of origin and developmental pathways uh, in, in cancer using single cell methods and using single cell biological methods. And we uh, really hope that all of this will um, uh, eventually uh, lead to better understanding of cancer and therefore better management of cancers. Uh, but this, for this to happen, there should not be any failing on diversity. Uh, genomics has failed in diverse on diversity in the in uh, for in in the uh, during the past many years uh, in the GWAS studies in the genome wide association studies. Primarily, that has happened in individuals of um, European descent. And as we are trying to understand using single cell technologies, uh, inclusivity is of paramount importance. And uh, that's the reason why the equity working group was. Um, uh, was, was formed, was established early on uh, in the HCA and uh, many of us who have been involved with the equity working group uh, are actually trying to promote inclusivity uh, in, in the working of the human cell atlas. 
The roadmap of the human cell atlas is that uh, we are looking at various organs of the body, various tissues in organs of the body, um, and, and these are not being looked at in one particular uh, group, one particular population group, but it's across uh, ethnicities, genders, ages, um, and, and like I said, that we are uh, collecting tissues from various organs, dissociating these tissues into single cells and trying to understand uh, the gene expression and thereby trying to understand uh, the various kinds of cell types and states uh, in the organs, uh, uh, in the tissues and organs of the human body. Uh, that leads to, uh, in order to be able to do that, uh, a lot of experimental and computational methods have, uh, have had to be developed. Uh, these are still being uh, sharpened. Uh, there are many, many new methods that are actually uh, being formulated, both in uh, on the bench as also uh, in the computing lab. Uh, all of this, of course, uh, single cell genomics is expensive, remains expensive still. Um, and therefore, many uh, funders have been contacted by the leadership of the HCA and funders have come forward. And uh, some of these, uh, some of the equity um, uh, dimensions and some of the equity activities that we are able to undertake is because of, um, you know, because of this understanding of inclusiv inclusivity by the funders who have actually pitched in money in order to promote equity. Uh, HC is uh, actively promoting equity and is actively taking actions to share knowledge and knowledge of concepts and technologies. And, and of course, uh, these uh, workshops like this Latin American workshop, this is of course the second workshop earlier, there was another uh, that was held uh, where you know, these concepts and technologies were discussed, uh, both concepts, uh, concepts and technologies are actually evolving and therefore it is imperative that uh, you know th that there be an ongoing series of uh, such workshops and these are being um, organized by the leadership of the human cell atlas by the equity working group and these roadshows are primarily being held in uh, low and middle income countries uh, this this these uh, workshops are um, or the or the equity activities are meant to empower scientists from underserved and un less endowed countries to participate uh, in the activity in HCA, in the science of HCA. And uh, the idea is to uh, engage them as partners in research and translation, provide, uh, provide them with access to these technologies. These technologies are not easy to access. They are expensive now, and they need a lot of training to be able to um, uh, use these kinds of technologies uh, to the benefit uh, of, of biology. Uh, so providing access to these technologies, educate, build capacity and be educated. And the be educated part is also important. It's not like it's not like one way traffic. Uh, those those who are participating in um, these kinds of activities that promote equity are themselves being educated uh, by uh, through these uh, you know, various kinds of workshops and um, uh, roadshows that we're participating in. Um, um, HCA is also enabling provision of less expensive and more portable technologies and reagents, preferentially to the LMICs. Um, like I said, that the reagents and the uh, you know the, the the platforms and the reagents are both expensive. Uh, also, there are uh, the, there has been a lot of um, challenge in terms of um, you know doing single cell analysis because of lack of portability. But right now, there are newer technologies that have become available that make uh, these kinds of technologies more portable and more usable. Um, the Human Cell Atlas is actually committed to serve humanity. Um, and, and that commitment uh, comes in the form of a manuscript that we have developed. Um, the uh, equity and ethics and other uh, active members of the organizing committee, etc., cetera, uh, have um, developed a manuscript. Uh, the manuscript is uh, available uh, in open access, but we have submitted the manuscript to BMC Genomics and it's under review right now. Uh, the uh, main uh, points in that we have, we have made in this Human Cell Atlas, it is uh, about 10 pages long, the manuscript. Uh, essentially, what we have committed ourselves to is that uh, members of the HC are not going to do helicopter science. We've had enough of helicopter science where uh, you know, people from um, nations, certain nations will descend on certain other nations, uh, take the samples out, and uh, uh, you know, that's the kind of helicopter science that has been practiced in 
uh, in the past, but uh, the, right now it will be uh, the focus will be on local needs uh, through local collaboration. So it's not like taking samples out of the country and going elsewhere, uh, analyzing the samples. The main emphasis will be to first understand the local needs and also to empower the local scientists to be able to um, uh, analyze the samples, to be able to draw inferences, uh, possibly in a collaborative manner, because uh, left to themselves, it's, these are uh, difficult technologies to use, and therefore uh, these are best done in a collaborative mode, uh, but best done locally as well. Uh, and that's the way that uh, equity is promoted. Um, the membership of the Human Cell Atlas is open to scientists globally. It's, it's a very open organization. Uh, so anybody who wants to uh, become a member of the HCA can easily become by just registering. And membership uh, also allows, uh, first of all, um, exchange of ideas, exchange of protocols uh, and, and concepts. So it's, uh, um, it's a good idea to actually become a member of the Human Cell Atlas if one is interested in biology. Uh, the third point that we've made is that uh, we need to embrace, concert and work under the leadership of uh, local scientists. The, uh, even though the HCA has uh, leadership, but when it comes to individual projects in uh, multiple geographical regions, the leadership needs to be needs to be provided by the local scientists and that's how uh, it will promote uh, it will improve local science and that's the whole idea that um, the leadership will be provided by the local scientists and to the extent possible the samples that are collected the simple cell, single cell rna sequencing work etc will be done in local laboratories and uh, uh, that's that's the whole idea so uh, in in order to uh, the for the human cell atlas to impact uh, on biology, to understand cell by cell, the human body cell by cell, uh, one needs to uh, disseminate these various kinds of concepts and technologies such that uh, the whole of humanity is served, such that uh, the benefits are not accrued to a portion of humanity, but, uh, but globally. So that's the focus of this manuscript, which we hope will be accepted and published uh, soon. Um, we also need to understand how, whether, you know, it's one, one thing to say that this is what we've been doing and we are trying, but are we actually making any progress? So what are there some metrics? Are there some yardsticks by which we can ascertain whether we are making any progress? So we are, as a matter of fact, developing a set of metrics uh, to measure and track our uh, progress over time. Our progress, meaning progress of equity in HCA over time. And uh, the, the, the kind of metrics that we are thinking of, and we are open to discussion, open to suggestions, uh, the diversity of in investigators participating in the human cell atlas is one metric. By diversity, diversity of regions from which these uh, investigators um, are participating in the HCA. Uh, the donors, of course, uh, the HCA needs samples and the diversity of representation of donors, geographical, ethnic representation of the donors, um, is another metric of promoting uh, of, of uh, equity. The extent of populating with anonymized data of diverse groups in the database, uh, uh, all of the data will go into a database and they'll be in an anonymized fashion, but there will be uh, you know, uh, some, some kind of, a, uh, uh, of an identity of the uh, population groups from where uh, individuals have been sampled and their um, tissues have been analyzed, their cells have been analyzed. So the extent of uh, the diversity of, uh, in the database, the diversity of the population groups uh, that are represented is another metric that uh, should improve over time. The diversity should increase over time uh, and that will be um, uh, a metric of progress. Um, and also we are uh, trying an understanding, uh, having having promoted uh, HCA in local laboratories through local leadership, etc. Are there some benefits that are accruing to the local participants or to the local scientists uh, because of their participation? Is the science in those regions improving? Uh, understanding uh, of, of science and understanding of uh, you know, how to uh, analyze data, etc. So uh, the uh, benefits can accrue at two levels. One is that the level of promotion of science, improvement of science. The second is that the level of, um, uh, of the society and both need to be tracked over a period of time in order to uh, figure out whether we are making progress. So the whole idea is that we need to develop a set of metrics such that uh, equity does not, uh, is, is not a matter that's bound to the lips, but actually um, uh, we are able to track it and 
uh, and and see that uh, this is actually being um, uh, promoted and uh, it's um, it's improving over time. Uh, we uh, actually had published uh, some, you know our views on equity, the human cell atlas on equity. Uh, there were a set of ten points, ten lessons that we had learned, and this has been uh, a couple of years ago that we published this in Nature Medicine, and this is uh, available. Uh, this is in the open access, so anybody who, who wishes to uh, understand, and it's uh, the the commitment to humanity is a sequel to the lessons that we have learned, uh, and and we believe that uh, uh, you know that that commitment, the metrics that we are developing will actually show that uh, the human cell atlas is um, you know, serious about promoting e equity and is seriously uh, taking, on, uh, taking steps in order that uh, uh, there is diversification and uh, there is promotion of equity. So I'm going to stop here uh, in, with, uh, with these uh, you know, very general terms of what I've said about equity, but uh, you know, my participation or our participation in the Human Cell Atlas has also improved our science uh, through collaboration, through, through again, uh, uh, not necessarily through funding, but primarily through collaboration, understanding of uh, how these things are done, et cetera. And uh, we have been uh, beneficiaries of this kind of collaboration and knowledge. Uh, and I wish to share with, uh, with you some results of um, uh, single cell trans, uh, RNA sequencing work that we have done uh, in India, and we have focused primarily on um, oral cancer. Um, although the human cell atlas is trying to understand, uh, you know, the human body cell by cell, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's kind of important that we uh, address a specific disease uh, if we are supposed to generate funding locally, it becomes very, very difficult. And I've said this in the HCA organizing committee. It's become very difficult uh, to generate money for, uh, you know, for this, uh, for understanding or reconstructing the human body cell by cell, unless it's tied to some kind of a disease. So in our work on oral cancer, we are focusing on oral cancer, but also trying to understand uh, the, um, uh, the uh, you know, the, the uh, open, heterogeneity in, in the normal uh, oral cavity and uh, the normal cells in the oral cavity. Uh, so in, in terms of um, our understanding or our uh, single cell um, uh, transcriptomic work, we are actually uh, trying to generate data simultaneously on uh, the disease tissue as also on the normal tissue. Uh, that's the only way that we could generate funds locally to be able to participate uh, in the human cell atlas. Of course, right now, after we started this work, we now have uh, collaboration with other um, uh, you know, institutions uh, on, on other kinds of projects in the HCA where uh, we don't necessarily need to uh, choose diseases, but uh, th that funding has come from international funders. And so we are able to uh, participate just by looking at uh, you know, the, the normal tissues and the uh, tissues derived from normal uh, individuals without disease. So I will uh, now describe to you uh, some of our work. Uh, in initially, the work uh, concentrated on um, uh, DNA sequencing from bulk uh, cells and DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing, uh, bulk RNA sequencing. Slowly over a period of time, we have moved over to single cell uh, RNA sequencing, primarily uh, because we were uh, understanding that there is a lot of heterogeneity, cellular heterogeneity within the oral cavity. Uh, both in, uh, in the disease state as also in the um, normal state. Um, let me describe the disease to you. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the oral cavity is the most eighth most common cancer in the world. Uh, about 260,000 new cases arise annually. About two thirds of them arise in the developing countries. Um, uh, it accounts for about uh, 128,000 deaths uh, annually. Uh, it's related to tobacco usage. About a third of all tobacco-related cancers in uh, India is accounted for by uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the oral cavity. Um, although between 20 and 60% uh, of cancers of the oropharynx um, is associated with uh, human papilloma virus, as I shall mention soon, that in, uh, in the specific that we are looking at in the oral cavity, HPV involvement is, uh, is zero or uh, very minimal. Um, so in India, uh, compared to the West, uh, the site distribution of oral cancer is very different. 
in India, um, primarily uh, the the, um, uh, the oral cancer happens or, or affects uh, the gingival buccal complex, which is uh, really the um, oral cavity, uh, epithelial region, the oral cavity, uh, the floor of the mouth, etc. Um, and it, it's excluding the, it's essentially the entire oral cavity without the tongue and floor of mouth. Um, in the West, it's predominantly the tongue and the floor of mouth that's impacted on. The uh, gingival buccal complex is only, um, so it's essentially a, a reverse, a reverse scenario, scenario between India and the West. And also, if you look at the nature of usage of tobacco, which is very strongly linked with oral cancer, in India, it's predominantly tobacco chewing, while in the West, it's predominantly tobacco smoking. Whether this can account for this uh, uh, reversal in the epidemiology uh, or, or of the region in, uh, of the oral cavity where there is in, uh, where, uh, which is affected, uh, we do not know. But this is also uh, something very interesting, that the nature of usage, usage of tobacco is quite different in India compared to the West. Uh, uh, we, we looked at about a 200 set of 250 patients. Uh, we, most of them were male, uh, 72. Uh, most of them were middle-aged between 40 and 55 years. Most of them presented very uh, late. Uh, they, they love their tobacco. They uh, keep chewing until they can chew no more. And uh, the disease has, by that time, the disease has progressed quite late. And it, most of the patients who came to us were at uh, stage four disease. Uh, most, of course, most were exposed to tobacco. HPV infection was nearly absent. Um, we did over a period of time, like I said, our sample size is just a little over uh, 250. We are targeting um, about 500. Uh, the oral cancers, uh, the tumor suppressors are the major drivers of oral cancer. And the genes that are involved in um, oral cancer, the driver genes are, of course, uh, P53 is at the top, 64% of our um, oral cancer patients um, are driven by um, mutations uh, or alterations in, uh, in, in TP53. Then we have a set of patients, a set of uh, um, uh, about eight genes, eight to 10 genes that explain a large, uh, about 10% uh, of recurrence in um, by mutations in these driver genes, but also there is a long tail of mutations. And given the kind of sample sizes, we are able to detect uh, drive, uh, driver genes uh, in about three percent of with about three percent of recurrence. Most of these genes behave as tumor suppressors. Um, TP53, for example, as uh, all of uh, all of all of you may know, that uh, TP53 behaves both as a tumor suppressor and as an oncogene. In the context of oral cancer, it behaves as a tumor suppressor. Um, um, and and the, the, the way that we, uh, another way of understanding of that it behaves as a tumor suppressor is if you map the mutations on the genes, there is clustering of mutations. And as you can see that on TP53, there is clustering of mutations, even though uh, there are mutations that happen throughout the gene, but there is clustering of mutations. In all of these genes, one can test for clustering and one would find that there is clustering of mutations uh, um, in, in these genes that thereby, um, uh, you know, bolstering uh, our understanding or bolstering our finding from other kinds of analysis that um, uh, these, these driver genes behave as tumor suppressors. So essentially tumor suppressors drive oral cancer. Um, we also can look at heterogeneity um, in, in patient survival. And what one finds is that uh, the patients are actually grouped by, um, you know, primarily three genes that drive uh, these clusters or cluster these patients. One's a P53 cluster. The other is FAT1 with or without mutations in caspase 8. And the other is a heterogeneous group of uh, driver genes or alterations in the heterogeneous, heterogeneous uh, driver genes uh, that form the third cluster. If we look at survival of these various branches of each of these clusters, the survival probabilities are quite uh, uh, different, are statistically significantly different, which essentially means that it is important for us to understand uh, what kind of genomic alterations take, have, have taken place in these patients such that uh, one can actually um, uh, figure out that, uh, you know, what, what uh, um, make a prediction uh, of uh, the survival probability of these patients by knowing the molecular defect that has happened in these patients. Um, so again, we've done some cell line experiments to understand what happens when there are uh, alterations in uh, these various type of genes. 
The recurrence frequency distribution of ribogenes has a long tail, as you can see. There are many, many, many mutations uh, uh, in genes that, that uh, um, occur in less than 2% of the patients. And this long tail essentially means that um, there is a lot of heterogeneity in mutational profiles or mutational backgrounds of patients. Incidentally, these are mutations that are driver mutations that we are not talking about passenger mutations at all. So these are mutations in driver genes that has a long tail. Um, uh, so, uh, under, so essentially what it means is that there is a lot of heterogeneity and uh, this heterogeneity now look, needs to be uh, dissected even better. And uh, what we uh, realized is that if we take uh, every, if we look at, you know, mutational profiles of each patient, they are quite uh, different. And so what we next want to do is to look at uh, tumors taken from um, patients and look at um, the, uh, you know, cellular composition of the tumors and uh, understand the diversity of uh, cell types and there, thereby, uh, um, Know, understand how much of heterogeneity is there in the in the tumors. Uh, this heterogeneity, of course, we know uh, leads to variation in tumor growth uh, that impacts on therapy response, metastasis, and uh, probability of recurrence. Um, the heterogeneity also uh, influences interpatient variability in survival and treatment. Uh, so it's important that uh, we felt that it was important uh, or a natural consequence of the findings from our bulk. Uh, DNA and RNA sequencing work was to now move into uh, characterization of um, you know cell types and cell states in each of these uh, tumors, and so we naturally moved into uh, single cell RNA sequencing work. Um, so the uh, uh, our uh, objectives are to profile cell type diversity in the oral squamous cell carcinoma of the gingival buccal region to identify gene expression programs in different cell types and to investigate cellular interactions within a tumor ecosystem. Uh, I won't be able to describe to you in gory detail all of the objective, all of the uh, findings of our work, but I will summarize them uh, in, in some meaningful way, hopefully. Uh, the number of patients that we've been able to look at is about 12. Um, we've taken about 50 to 60,000 cells uh, from these 12 patients and all of the results that I'm going to describe to you is based on single cell analysis of these about, about 60,000 cells drawn from these uh, 12 patients. Um, buccal mucosa, uh, as you can see, is uh, what we are looking at, but uh, in a quarter of the patients, in three of the 12 patients, uh, there was a precancerous lesion that we knew uh, led to uh, the formation of the tumor. And this precancerous lesion is called oral submucous fibrosis um, that uh, preceded the formation of the malignant tumor in three of these patients. In the other nine patients, there was no um, evidence of a precancerous lesion uh, or at least no known evidence of a precancerous lesion. Um, the grades uh, were variable and uh, most of these uh, patients uh, had um, uh, well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, uh, which is the brown region, and followed by moderately differentiated, and uh, then in, uh, one one of the patients, one patient had infiltrating uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So the grades are also uh, quite high. Uh, these are all um, you know, high grade lesions uh, or tumors, and uh, those that's the kind of those are the kinds of tumors that we have analyzed. Uh, we've uh, uh, classified the cells, we have drawn cells, and I, as I said, that uh, roughly 5,000 cells from each individual. Uh, we've classified these cells into malignant, malignant and non-malignant cell types. The standard method of uh, classification is to use in for C and B that relies on the fact that there are copy number alterations in, um, in, in cells of the uh, in, in the malignant cells and therefore use copy number alterations in order to identify uh, malignant cells. We have also devised a, another computational method, which we have called as the distance profiling method that, usually, that uh, looks at uh, the gene expression uh, levels uh, or gene expressions of uh, epithelial cells, which are the ones that uh, lead to uh, become malignant, epithelial cells based on the reference non-epithelial cell. And based on these distances, we uh, um, so this is uh, on the on the x-axis are the distances, on the y-axis are the number of cells 
uh, with uh, at that particular distance. And as you can see that there is a clear antimode and on the right side of this antimode are the ones that are quite distant from non-malignant, non-epithelial cells. Um, uh, uh, and uh, we, we those, those are the ones that we call as uh, malignant cells. So there are two different ways that we have classified cells into malignant and non-malignant. Um, if you look at uh, the profile of uh, the um, uh, of OSCCGB, uh, what one finds is that there are essentially seven uh, cell types. Uh, of course, the malignant cell types is, is large, and there are mast cells, B cells, myeloid cells, and so on and so forth. Um, each cell type has representative cells from all of the patients, so all of the tumors contribute to these various cell types. If you look at malignant cells. Um, these are the malignant cells. If you look at the malignant cells, it's interesting that the malignant cells cluster uh, by patient. It's not like uh, these clusters are extremely tight, but by and large, um, tumors of patients have characteristic features that uh, make them uh, cluster by um, the patient type as, as opposed to the cell type. Uh, on the other hand, the non-malignant cells cluster by cell type, and that was an interesting finding. Uh, we looked at uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition in uh, oral squamous cell carcinoma, and we found one of those cells, one of those clusters was enriched with cells that uh, had partial uh, EMT uh, and hypoxia related genes. Uh, uh, you know, as you can see, that BIM, F1A, these are, these are uh, hypoxia related genes and uh, partial EMT related genes. Um, in this one cluster, in cluster 14, there was a uh, uh, a concentration of these kinds of uh, expressions of these kinds of cells. Um, the, the higher correlation of hypoxia and uh, was observed in this particular cluster, cluster number 14, and we identified the genes that might actually play a role in hypoxia-mediated uh, partial EMT in OS, uh, OSCCGB. So uh, partial EMT is an important uh, you know, sort of a driver program in OSCCGB. Um, uh, we looked at um, these non-malignant cells and essentially, uh, you know, we found that there was a lot of uh, diversity in uh, myeloid cells, in uh, fibroblasts and so on and so forth. Uh, don't have the time to really get into uh, uh, the details of this, but each cell type had uh, a lot of uh, heterogeneity. Uh, the T cells were abundant in the tumors um, with diverse cell types and infiltration. Uh, the dominant B cell types, uh, even though there was a lot of diversity, some, some amount of diversity in the B cell types, the dominant B cell types were the plasma and memory B cells. Uh, again, uh, the myeloid cell types also in the previous graph, I didn't spend any time in the previous graph, but uh, among the, there was a lot of heterogeneity in the myeloid cell types, uh, types also. And the, among the, in that subtype, uh, M1 macrophages are the most common. Um, uh, and the macrophages in tumors exhibit an intermediate M1 to M2 polarization state. Um, diverse endothelial cell subtypes known to perform a variety of cellular functions were also present. So essentially, we were able to identify some um, interesting programs that are interesting uh, changes um, that take place in OSCCGB, and we were able to uh, also, do. so that that's essentially in the normal tissue, in the normal oral tissue. But uh, in the malignant cells, like I said, that um, uh, you know the malignant cells uh, essentially group by patient, and there also we identified that there are essentially two groups, um, as you can see. Uh, and and interestingly enough, the group one and uh, group one individuals, individuals in group one, are the uh, individuals who had prior. Uh, pre-cancer oral submucous fibrosis that progressed to oral cancer. So essentially, uh, those individuals, those patients who had a prior pre-malignant uh, lesion and progressed to oral cancer, they have uh, sing their single cell profiles are quite different uh, compared to those that did not show any uh, precancerous lesion uh, in the oral cavity. Uh, we subclassified the malignant cells and uh, essentially uh, fetal and germline epithelial cells were abundant and uh, malignant cells are abundantly expressed in genes of the immune-related um, pathways. Uh, so um, uh, immune-related pathway genes are abundantly expressed in the malignant cells, which is actually uh, good news for uh, imm immunotherapy. Uh, so uh, to summarize, uh, gingivobuccal oral cancer which is the predominant cancer among males in Southeast Asia, 
exhibits large intratumor cell type heterogeneity. Uh, those tumors that are derived from precancerous lesion of the um, uh, precancerous lesion, which is the oral submucous fibrosis, they exhibit a distinct expression profile compared to those that are not associated with this precancer. So what we, have, and we are now trying to do is uh, to uh, you know, take a number of uh, oral submucous fibrosis patients and find out which of the genes that are expressed early on, uh, whether or not we can prevent precipitation of uh, frank malignancy by uh, managing those patients that show, um, that, that, uh, show um, expression levels of some of these genes that we have found. Uh, in this group one um, set of cells. Uh, fetal uh, cellular reprogramming and partial EMT play major roles in uh, oral, sub, uh, oral squamous cell carcinoma of the genuine buccal region um, and, uh, and in the process of tumor genesis, fetal cellular reprogramming and uh, uh, partial ep uh, epithelial to mesenchymal uh, transformation play a major role. So uh, that's essentially what I uh, really had to present to you. Uh, I'm very glad to have participated in um, early on in uh, the Human Cell Atlas, without which it would become uh, it would be almost impossible for us to um, generate this kind of data and to understand uh, oral cancer in, uh, uh, in in this kind of depth. Uh, primarily because we uh, needed people who actually were conversant with the technologies, who were a sort of inventors of these technologies to handhold us, to take us through the various steps. Uh, and this could not have been possible without uh, uh, promotion of collaboration and equity uh, that, that are considered of paramount importance uh, in the human cell atlas. So I uh, really hope that uh, this particular workshop will help uh, scientists uh, in, in various countries of Latin America uh, to be able to participate in single cell activity and to be able to understand uh, diseases of local interest at the single cell level uh, while simultaneously also understanding uh, what happens to the normal body that gets uh, not, not, yeah, cells in the normal body that gets perturbed in order to uh, precipitate a disease state. Uh, again, I thank uh, uh, the organizers for giving me a chance to, um, to uh, present my work and most importantly to present uh, uh, the fact that equity is of paramount importance uh, in the Human Cell Atlas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation, uh, for the overview about HCA and the equity committee and especially on giving us one example of how you chose uh, disease that is particularly relevant to your region and um, uh, results that show the application of uh, single cell um, RNA sequencing. I would have many questions about that because uh, you know that I am interested in this kind of cancer, uh, but we do have a few questions here for you from the audience. So a question or a comment also from Adolfo Alexis. He uh, thanks you very much for your talk. He thinks it's very interesting uh, that cells group according to patients and um, not cell types. And he would like you to make a comment or give a, like, an explanation about why that is. Um, the why question is very difficult to answer. Uh, the reason why this is happening is that there are different patients have predominant uh, cell types that are different, and we still don't understand uh, why this is happening. Of course, uh, you know the group one in the in the group one set of clusters where there is a precancerous lesion leading to uh, malignancy, we can understand that 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 particular set of patients behaves differently from the others, but why uh, malignant cells uh, cluster by patients, we still don't have a clear insight. Uh, that's an interesting finding, but again, uh, we have not been able to um, clearly understand why that should happen. Uh, but of course, there are differences in cell types across patients. Thank you. There's another question here by Luisa Neto. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask you if during your analysis, you were able to detect some viral signatures, and if so, 
in this approach if you can assign viral signatures to specific cell types or hosts? Uh, so in, uh, we ha still haven't uh, uh, analyzed the single cell data for viral signatures, uh, but the most prominent virus that is uh, associated with uh, oropharyngeal uh, cancer is the human papilloma virus. Uh, we have not, uh, in our bulk analysis, we had specifically looked for human papilloma virus and we did not find. Uh, we do plan to uh, look at the single cell data and try and understand um, whether we find viral signatures there, we haven't done that analysis yet. We do plan to do that analysis. Right. And uh, we are running short in time here, but I would like you to, uh, as a final remark, give us some advice about uh, how to go about our Latin American network. We have many similarities with the Asian one. Uh, regarding the diversity of culture and countries that are joining, also our um, um, financial questions and how to engage with this uh, technology. So if you can give us a piece of advice based on your experience. So I, I don't have really uh, any advice, but I can share uh, one or two uh, bullet points of my experience. The first thing that I experienced is what I told you right in the beginning, that if we are to generate funding from our own countries, uh, we have to uh, you know, couch it in some disease terms. Just saying that uh, we are trying to reconstruct the normal body uh, funding agencies, at least in India, did not come forward. It was almost impossible for us to generate funds. The second uh, what uh, that I would say is that uh, initially it will be one or two labs that will participate. And once you've uh, you know, published uh, a manuscript or two describing some kind of a disease or some kind of a problem, uh, solving some kind of a problem of local interest, then other uh, labs will join. Initially, there will be a lot of hesitation, primarily because this kind of work is uh, not easy and there, there one will uh, you know, encounter a large number of failures, even dissociating uh, you know, a, a tissue to single cells is not something that's easy. The third, I would say, is that uh, you know, build, build networks uh, globally, not just regionally, but also globally. And uh, you know, this global networking has actually helped us. Uh, as, so far as I'm concerned, I, my global network was before I uh, initiated uh, or became a part of the HCA Asia network. Um, of course, the global network was formed even before the HCA Asia network, but uh, I joined the Asia network. Uh, by the time I joined the Asia network, I had good uh, collaboration or good um, uh, relationship with the global partners uh, who, were, uh, who now constitute the leadership of the HCA. So these would be the kinds of uh, steps that one might take. And once you collaborate with global partners, global funding also becomes easy uh, because then, uh, of course, the global funders know that your data is are uh, going to be deposited in global databases with uh, that are open access and people around the world can benefit. Uh, while you know, in, in regional terms, uh, global funders are um, not so forthcoming primarily because they are unsure that your data will be accessible by uh, you know people in other parts of the world. Right. This is a great point about accessibility, and this is something we always discuss too a lot when we are working uh, in a network with, with different regions and different um, cultures, right, and with different uh, specific yes. norms that we have to address in each country. This is also a very important point of discussion over here. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have to uh, go because of our uh, time constraints. We do have an another couple of questions here. If you have time, I know that you are in a different time zone and that could be complicated. Maybe you could address them in the chat. Um, but anyway, Partha, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join us and your insights were very, 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 very valuable to us and in particular, the idea of addressing uh, regional problems first, which will interest our uh, local funders. This is something that we all have to keep in mind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patty. Thank you for inviting me. So I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker of this uh, session. So Dr. Andres Moreno Estrada, he's a Mexican population geneticist interested in human genetic diversity and its implications in population history and medical genomics. 
He's a medical doctor by training from the University of Guadalajara. He pursued a PhD in evolutionary genetics in Barcelona, where he was trained in human population genetics and worked on the analysis of genetic variation in candidate genes under positive selection of the human lineage. Dr. Moreno was a postdoctoral fellow um, at Cornell University and Stanford University School of Medicine, and he later became an associate a research associate of the genetics department at Stanford University until 2014. For his work in Latin America, he was awarded the George Rosencrantz Prize for Healthcare Research in Developing Countries in 2012. His work integrates genomics, anthropology, and evolution in projects involving large collections of underrepresented populations, particularly from indigenous communities across the Americas and the Pacific. He authored the most detailed work so far of the genetic structure of the Mexican population, including the first genomic characterization of 20 diverse indigenous groups throughout Mexico, as well as numerous genomic studies in South America and Polynesia. He also studied the genetic impact of transatlantic African migrations in the Caribbean and transpacific Asian migrations into Mexico during colonial times. Um, since 2015, Professor Moreno is the principal investigator at the Human in Evolutionary Genomics Lab at the National Laboratory of Genomics for Biodiversity in Mexico. He's also the co-founder of the Latin American Alliance for Genomic Diversity and member of the Executive Committee of the International Common Disease Alliance, ICDA. Uh, thank you so much, Andres, for joining us here today. Thank you very much, Patty, for the introduction, and especially to all the organizers uh, for the invitation. It's really a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, literally, I couldn't be more thrilled about the you know success of you know the culmination of making this happen. I think this 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 event it's important for Latin America. It's great to show these ties also with HEA as a global project. So yeah, pleasure to be here. Um, I also want to thank, um, maybe you don't see this effort behind the scenes, but I understand there are uh, simultaneous interpreters translating this uh, to Spanish. So also, um, you know, our recognition to them doing this hard work. And just to make them more challenging, um, voy a dar también una introducción muy rápido en español para que el otro traductor esté haciéndolo al inglés, pero solo para reforzar la idea de que es un gusto estar en este evento. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación, Patti. Y, los, y a todos los organizadores. I'm going to present actually on behalf of a um, large network of collaborators. So it's really, you know, uh, an honor to be presenting on behalf of this project that is a regional project in Latin America funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, that is a funding branch of uh, CZI called Ancestry Networks for the Human Cell Atlas. So our project is called uh, Human Cell Map of Latin American Diversity or Latin cells for short. So uh, first of all, I want to introduce the team. So like I said, I, I have the privilege to be coordinating this group, but it's really the work of you know, many institutions and many um, collaborators that are part of this, uh, of this network. Uh, you can see here that it involves uh, six different countries. So from Mexico, uh, myself, together with Carlos Ortiz, uh, Daniela Robles, uh, we have collaborators uh, from Colombia, Dr. Barreto, uh, from Peru, Carla Gallo, from Chile, Vinicius Maracaya, who is also organizing this event, um, Ricardo Verdugo, also from Chile, and also from Brazil, we have uh, two Patricias, Patricia Severino and Patricia Posic, as well as another collaborator uh, based in the, clinic, uh, the Mayo Clinic in Florida, working with uh, Latino communities uh, in the US. So that's kind of the brief summary of who we are. And then I would like to also to highlight some of the characteristics of our team, because I think it also stands out a little bit in the um, usual composition of projects that have been awarded by CCI to support the ACA. And I would highlight the, first of all, one of the characteristics that I think is unique is that we are a 100% Latin team working uh, and studying Latin American population, which is also quite unusual as you have seen also these bias in diversity composition of research teams. So we are very proud about that. Also the fact that um, all the institutions involved in receiving funding and managing all the resources of the project are also 100% in Latin American countries. So I think that's also uh, an unprecedented thing. 
I think our project is the only one where the coordinating institution is uh, based outside what we you know know as the global north you know mostly the us europe and other you know high income countries which i think it's also setting a positive precedent to try to shift the leadership towards the region where we're interested in in working with populations that have not been represented before so it's not only about including them in the research but also bringing the resources locally to the institutions that are right next to those communities to do this kind of work so i think this i hope this project will set a precedent towards more support in latin america and the same along the same line is the fact that we are um, setting up a research design, as you will see in the next slides, that is 100% conducted within the region. And this is another thing that we have been trying to do in the lab and other collaborations that we already have, like the Mexico Biobank in my lab, and others also throughout Latin America that we are really convinced about trying to keep the leadership uh, within the region. This doesn't mean that is you know close from international collaboration. No, not mean not at all. I mean we are very open uh, to collaborate internationally outside the region. Um, actually, HCA is very much a global initiative. But I think in terms of conducting most of this research in the local regions, will provide also um, uh, local capacity building as well as co contributing to the global effort. So uh, I already mentioned the team, and as you can see here, um, the faces and affiliations, I, I want just to highlight that, you know, together we represent different expertises, which also was kind of a requirement from CZI to have teams that have uh, at least three major areas represented, which are community engagement and sampling, and, and several of us in the team have previous experience in working with a lot of indigenous and, and, and Latin American communities throughout the region. Um, this implies, uh, you know, protocols and, and experimental expertise in processing samples in cellular biology and several uh, molecular um, bio biology labs that are locally established already, like in Peru, in Brazil, in Chile, in Mexico, and so on, as well as the ability to be um, you know, capable to analyze the data that comes out of that. And particularly because single cell is such a novel technology, it's also um, kind of a uh, an unusual configuration to, to really have local experts that have already experience in this. And we have uh, several of them, like uh, Vinicius, Carlos, Daniela, that have been really working already with this kind of gene expression data. And as well, we have experience, and this is another big commitment of the project, of um, training also our students and our local research communities. And I think this very symposium is a great example of doing so. So let me give you just a um, little bit of a background why we think this is important, not only to have a, a region that has not been represented. Now let's have it represented just for the sake of geographic coverage or something like that. It's also a scientific imperative to really study populations that have shown scientifically that there are uh, unique and highly substructured, and that's the case of Latin America. As you all know, we have populations that have a lot of admixture in their uh, genomic composition, and therefore an open question is to which extent this substructure is reflected in gene expression patterns that depend on uh, geographic divisions or um, you know, uh, uh, ethnic differences between uh, populations and populations of, of, of all different variables that we can explore. So maybe the, the, the foundation of this uh, hypothesis is the fact that we have seen that at the genetic level, there is actually a lot of differences uh, between different Latin American populations. And what I'm showing here is just a PCA plot, which summarizes clustering patterns of different Latin American populations, looking only at their um, Native American fraction of their genome. So basically we can map which, reg which regions across the chromosomes are of indigenous origin, and then we can uh, plot them against uh, reference populations, which are the ones uh, here in labels. So you can see uh, labels that are references from Mexico all the way from the Amazonian region, the Andes, South America, covered like in these three major um, uh, clusters here. And then the color circles are, like I said, the indigenous fraction of, you know, of uh, ethnic populations from different countries, as you can see here, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, and Argentina. So you can see that there are clusters that are like quite discrete and different between, for example, the Colombian individuals clustering together with the references from the Amazonia region, which is you know, um, uh, in agreement with the geographical um, provenance of those individuals. As in opposite direction, we see, for example, the Peruvian samples closer to the Andean cluster here represented by Quechua and Aymara individuals, which makes sense. What I think is striking is that this distribution does not overlap with this reference sample from Mesoamerican region, which means that this genetic profile is 
um, quite different from what we could find in Mexico or Mesoamerica, for example. But this just speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, lumping together as a single category, just Latin Americans, as it happens in many studies within the US and other contexts as well, is really not ideal because there's a lot of diversity that we're not capturing by just putting everyone together. So again, the question is to which extent these differences can be reflected in gene expression patterns. Um, so the design to explore this, I just will give a quick overview of the project, is to bring together different uh, groups that have already access to local communities. And this is the map that you see here at the bottom on the left. And this includes both um, rural and, and urban areas, which therefore will be including indigenous and ethnic populations. And the whole design involves not only collecting locally, but also processing at least in three local hubs that we call processing hubs, so that we um, you know, bring the capacity of doing all the steps of the research uh, within the region. Like I said, at least um, we have three processing locations that are Mexico, Chile, and Brazil. And then once uh, libraries have been prepared locally in these hubs, they will be also sent uh, for sequencing within the region. Uh, so far, that, that capacity is being um, um, offered by the Brazilian site with Patricia Severino at the um, Einstein Hospital in Sao Paulo. And then together with this, um, we are not only going to directly sequence samples collected, but also uh, taking samples for um, DNA extraction and therefore genotyping for ancestry estimation. And I will explain that in a bit. Um, so once we have these two types of data, we'll be doing joint analysis across the different um, analysis hubs as well in the network. And then this return back to um, you know, presenting results and training people and students throughout the analysis of this, uh, of this data set. Um, importantly, it's not only uh, did I mention, sorry, that these will be mostly based um, in a cellular map of PBMC cells, so taken from blood samples. And the reason for that is, of course, uh, it, it, it's, it's the most accessible and, and, and easiest sample to, to, to collect, but at the same time, um, to try to cover as, as many um, geographic regions as possible, and with blood is the one that is most feasible. But at the same time, we're going to expand the project towards older tissues including uh, solid tissue that we have access to through other uh, cohort recruitments in the network. And particularly one that will be included uh, from the outset right now is um, gallbladder, which is important because particularly in, in Chile, there's a documented correlation between the Mapuche ancestry and the risk um, for gallbladder cancer. So this is uh, a plot that I'm showing here uh, on the right, where you can see that um, the higher Mapuche ancestry here correlates with higher risk of a popular cancer. And this is specific to that ancestry because you can see the opposite when you see Chilean individuals, the same region with Aymara ancestry, they do not have the same uh, correlation with risk. So we think that by mapping um, the, 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 the cellular map of what the gene expression pattern in gallbladder samples, individuals of Mapuche and non-Mapuche ancestry will be a, a, a very valuable reference map for future disease studies in this, in this uh, disorder. So um, just to summarize the three major aims that we have in the project, I already mentioned um, constructing this map for RNA profiling of immune cells uh, across Latin American populations. And again, this will be done through uh, blood sample collections. Um, second of all, will be to create this new bio network. So, so far has not been represented in the HCA project, a bio network focused on global bladder. So that will be a new addition. And like I mentioned, it will involve collecting blood, uh, samples uh, from Aymara and Mapuche ethnic groups in Chile. Um, also, we will create a Latin American community portal, which will be um, um, online site where people will be able to uh, log in and visualize the data that we've been producing, but also being able to an conduct analysis even within the portal and will serve as a channel also for training uh, and future um, data sharing as well. So here at the top, I'm just uh, showing a quick um, workflow of what I just said, which is having these two parallel um, flows of, of data collections. On one side, PBMCs from blood, on the other one side, uh, frozen samples from gallbladder. And they follow a common path all the way until the end, which is you know, on-site sample processing and then biobanking. Once we genotype the samples, we select those that are more suitable for um, library prep. And this depends on just double checking the ancestry that can represent best um, you know, diverse groups within the region. And then once libraries are prepped, then blood samples go for single cell sequencing and then frozen gallbladder solid tissue go for single nuclei RNA sequencing instead of um, 
single cell, just because uh, these cannot be conducted in fresh samples, because they come from frozen specimens, they will be analyzing through single nuclei, which is, has a little bit of less resolution than single cell, but I think uh, it, as a first map, it's still very informative. And then all this goes through bioinformatic analysis using this uh, you know, tools that have been developed also by members of our group uh, to analyze uh, uh, gene expression data. So what we have accomplished so far, well, this is project that actually is just a starting. So I, I, we don't have like yet results from our own data because this is just literally awarded at the end of last year. So we were, um, you know, starting from scratch. This implies like a whole new design of uh, protocols and approvals. So first of all, the, the, the very first thing we uh, gave, gave priority to is to get our protocol approved by local IRB. And this is something we already have. So we have the IRB approval from the ethics committee. We already did community engagement. And this was also even before the proposal, we had already contact with communities, but in particularly the context of this pro of, in this project, we already have uh, contacted so several communities that are on board for uh, participating. And also the initial sampling and field work is about to start. So we are literally just, uh, you know, have everything ready to go uh, this month, at least in some pilot sites uh, within Mexico and Colombia to start the sampling and field work. And we have also standardized the protocol that we will be using for PBNC um, for blood cells isolation on site, which is a, not a trivial thing when you talk about going to remote areas throughout different rural um, um, uh, sites. And then uh, collecting blood samples, keeping them, um, you know, stabilized and then still viable for library prep back in the lab. So this is something that we're doing through a uh, isolation protocol that uses magnetic magnetic beads to isolate the blood cells on site. And this is not this. The advantage of this is that this does not require centrifuge. That usually uh, is done. It's like a magnetic field that is portable. You can use it in the field. And this is. Uh, using um, some some technologies developed by stem cell. So we already tried that and it works quite well. Um, so the other advantage that we have been doing so far, and don't think this is very automatic, may, it may sound for many of you that you just get money, buy the equipment, and then that's it. Well, when you have limited funds, like in Latin America, even with these projects, we struggle with you know uh, higher costs of reagents and equipment. So even if you want to conduct the same study that you know people is conducted in the UK, it will cost maybe you know 50% more or so in Latin America just because of all the processing involved of importation and the distributors and so on. So um, I'm not necessarily saying this is a negative thing, but that's a, ch as a challenge that has to be overcome. And we have done this year, uh, I think a positive achievement in terms of negotiating with 10X genomics, the fact that throughout this project, we will be getting um, you know the possibility to equip three sites with the actually the instrument that, that does the library preparation, which is the Chromium X instrument from 10X. And uh, within, within the project, we will be equipping at least three sites, like Mexico, Chile, and Brazil, like I said, our processing hubs. So again, this is a good achievement that involves uh, a lot of negotiation also between the distributors, the manufacturer. And while I will say as a take home message here, while it's true that it's challenging and, and costs are, are, are higher in our region, um, Manufacturers and companies do listen. I mean, when, when we propose something that also is, is reasonable for, for them to partner with us, it's possible to also get into, into agreements. I'm not saying that is by default what they would be you know, keen to listen to. For, you know, any company would just be more comfortable with selling at you know price list and then people would just uh, stick to that. But I'm just saying that if we come together as a regional project it's, uh, and then we propose a, a solid plan for also having a good partnership, it is possible. So we have been also doing that as part of the project. So uh, after we get these sites equipped, uh, then the single cell library construction training by them will be coming soon. And it will start as soon as the equipped, uh, our equipments are, are installed. So what's next? Um, like I mentioned, we will be genotyping samples um, for a genetic association. And this, this comes from an overall sample scheme that we have then to select those, uh, like I mentioned before, the samples that are more suitable for uh, single cell sequencing. So we will be conducting a pilot study before entering the larger scale of the project with uh, a subset. And this will be conducted, like I said, in the field work happening in Mexico and Colombia shortly. And then all the way through library prep, data QC, and then we will uh, propagate the same model to the rest of sites. So 
And then I'll just want to, you know, while we get data from our own, while we, while we, while we, we generate that, I will just want to summarize what kind of tools and resources we expect to generate throughout the project. And as you have seen from the beginning, even it was shown with the genomic data example, our labs have been developing several ancestry specific pipelines that are suitable also in the context of gene expression data. So one of the tools that we have been applying that was actually initially implemented for, for gene expression parts, such as TSNE, we have been implementing an ancestry specific um, variation of that same uh, approach for um, genetic data. So basically we have that already implemented to analyze uh, data that comes from specific ancestors. And this is particularly suitable in the context of data that will be generated from admix individuals. Um, similarly, we have admix specific UMAP um, um, techniques uh, and the local ancestry estimation from genetic data that we have developed in the past as well. So all that will be directly applicable to what we will get. And then uh, there will be also several uh, data analysis pipelines for um, RNA sequencing data. And this includes also um, methods developed by members of our of our group, like the um, uh, index um, identification um, um, methods that have been developed to increase the sensitivity to identify cell populations. And this is algorithms that have been developed um, recently, in, mostly in other systems, but it have been, can be also transferred for human data of gene expression. Um, other tools also that can uh, allow us to to, to analyze co-expression modules like the semi tool also developed by the group. And this will be pipeline that will be available also through our portal, but as well for the whole HCA community. And then what we will develop throughout the conduction of the project, of course, is protocols to you know, preserve samples, like I was mentioning, taking remote locations, how to do this from remote location to uh, processing hubs, um, and then how to control to, uh, you know, um, uh, for batch effects because we will be producing data in different sites. We will be important to have also um, some, some protocol for harmonization of the surveys will be, be, will, that will be applied not only within our network, which will be of course the same across sites, but also across other ancestry networks in the HCA. And this is another uh, active uh, discussion that we have with the CCI um, um, team uh, uh, as other projects have been doing similar work in other regions. And again, protocols to, to do tissue preparation for the gallbladder network. Um, and so on. So, so future future extensions of the project could include other approaches like ATAC-seq and a special transcriptomics, which we initially had in the in the proposal, but it had to be excluded due to um, um, you know, budget limitations, which is always um, you know, something we had to do. Um, finally, I will just mention that importantly, we have perspectives also that throughout this project, we can also contribute towards reducing these bias that exist in, in all sorts of omics data, not only in genomic data, but even more so in, in gene expression level data that has been, again, mostly biased towards European descent populations. So with this project, we hope to uh, counterbalance that bias by adding data from Latin American populations. Also, not only the data, as this was mentioned also at the beginning, that we hope to improve also the diversity of researchers is for heading and leading these efforts on our own populations. And also the fact that um, the technology is just so novel as well, even worldwide, that in Latin America, there are very few uh, places where this will capacity uh, will be available. So by, by conducting this project, we hope to have this capacity installed, not only for this project, but for future coming efforts and the, the technology will be there and there will be easier also for uh, other proposals that, you know, maybe with even smaller scale funding could be just uh, ready to be used this technology because that expense will be already done. And lastly, of course, the training, which is, like I said, this very symposium is already helping with that, but we hope to have, um, you know, uh, workshops, not only, um, you know, in person or virtual, also in local languages, including, um, you know, all these tools that we'll be concentrating in our portal to facilitate uh, data sharing, accessibility, and inclusion. So this is, um, you know, again, just giving examples of places in our network that already have that capacity, like the genotyping facility um, in the lab that I'm leading here in Mexico, or the sequences that, that is also, uh, you know, very much uh, up to date in the, in the Brazilian side of the Einstein Hospital in Sao Paulo. Um, uh, and many other places, actually, Chile has also the capacity to do the sequencing and genotyping and analysis. So. I keep saying that the region is ready for larger scale uh, efforts, and I think this is one of them, and I'm happy that it's becoming a reality. 
And I look forward to maybe, you know, talk about results next year if I'm being invited again to, to talk about what we are finding. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Andres, for this uh, great overview of uh, the project, Latin Cells. Um, I would like to highlight something that you commented on the diversity of our group and how it brings together different cultures and countries and that many of us have never met in person. So I think that this is a, an important thing to say to the value of this kinds of meetings and the discussions that come right after them, you know, and we were able to put all this together uh, based on uh, trust, right, and local capabilities. Um, it's a, it was a, a great talk on that. We do have a question here on the chat. So I'd like to address that before we talk a little bit more. We kind of have a little time for discussions uh, uh, today. But there is a question, a technical question actually, on the choice of using single cell RNA seq for the PBMC cells and single, and single uh, nucleus RNA seq for the gallbladder. Maybe you can give us a word on that. Sure, I, I think I mentioned it briefly, but. Um... Basically, it's it's better, of course, to conduct these these kind of experiments in fresh samples. Uh, that's how you get the, the better resolution from 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 the single cell um, isolation. So so that can be conducted in in any tissue potentially, but definitely with blood samples is easier because on site you can literally isolate. And this is what I was mentioning about the magnetic field approach we will be using, so that the samples on site are isolated and then kept, kept frozen and then transported um, like you know snap frozen all until you get to a lab where you can actually construct the library. And that's feasible with the uh, blood for sure. So with gut bladder, we will need to implement a um, new strategy to do the same. And to be safer, we, we think that samples taken during surgeries, for example, they will be like prophylactic surgeries in people that have, are that are at higher risk of, you know, gallbladder stones, and 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 that's the approach that we will be following. Those samples will be taken uh, most likely during surgery, so uh, and they will be snap frozen as well. And from for us to get access to those, it will be uh, were easier to warranty that at least the frozen sample is the one that we will be having access to, and not the fresh sample. So. From frozen samples, you cannot do the single cell sequencing approach, but the single nuclei, uh, which give, like like I was mentioning, gives gives um, a less resolution, but still a good ability to have an overview of the gene expression pattern of the tissue. And maybe in the future we can Im improve that protocol so that it can be done actually directly on fresh samples. Yeah, I think uh, that's a that's a great uh, explanation, highlighting uh, how difficult it is to work with different sites, different locations, right? During um, uh, during a project that involves so many different countries. And uh, a final question: uh, How do, in your in your view, how does a single cell analysis um, add to what you have already studied uh, concerning uh, ancestry uh, backgrounds in diseases? Right. No, it's a, it's a very open question a very, and, a, and a very exciting one, because, again, while, while the genomic patterns have been, you know, to some extent, well studied, you know, quote unquote, it's still a lot of, a lot to, 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 to redefine as well. But it's very clear that there are differences that correlate with geography, with ethnicity, and that has been, you know, even with language and many other, um, you know, characteristics that we know that there is a lot of substructure at the genetic level. So to which extent that really um, pushed the, the the map of diversity towards gene expression level again is something that we we haven't explored and not only the map itself in terms of saying well there's differences or not between populations the fact that we're also adding this a layer of genetic information from the same individual that we will be having the gene expression pattern allows us to link the gene expression with particular genetic variants on those individuals so hopefully to try to map also uh, eqtls and other uh, regions of the genome that could be influencing different uh, expression levels. And then we can you know, correlate whether that is due to some uh, particular uh, ethnic groups or geographic regions, and that's what is unknown. Definitely that's something, uh, even at the global scale, there are several efforts such as GTEx, for example, that tries to do these kind of things in different tissues, but again, has been very limited towards post-mortem donors of single ancestry that 
as you can imagine, does not involve ancestry from Latin America because, you know, post-mortem donors mostly have been accessible through U.S. hospitals, for example, and this kind of, again, the, the, the bias of recruitment has been towards people of European descent. So it's an open question globally and even more for Latin America. All right, so I'll be introducing our next speaker. Our next speaker is Mariana Boroni. She is a, an associate researcher at the Brazilian National Cancer Institute, INCA. She is leader of the Bioinformatics and Computational Biology Laboratory at this institution and lecturer of the postgraduate program in oncology at the same institution. Uh, she is also the co founder of the startup called OneSkin. She holds a bachelor and master's degree in biochemistry from the Federal University of Vissosa in Brazil and a PhD in bioinformatics from the University, Federal University of Minas Gerais with an internship at the NIH. Um, she had a professional experience in bioinformatics as a postdoc at the Gene Center at Ludwig Maximilian uh, München University in Germany and at the Center for Computational Biology at the, at the Cancer and Genomic Science Institute at the University of Birmingham in England as a visiting researcher. She works in the field of bioinformatics, molecular biology and biochemistry with emphasis on omics integration and application of artificial intelligence techniques in cancer biology and aging. Welcome, Mariana. Thank you so much, Patricia, for your kind introduction. Thank you and all the organizers for this um, invitation. It is really a pleasure to be here today. So as I was saying, it, it is a, really a, a pleasure to be here today and uh, a very nice opportunity to uh, share with you all what we are what we are doing in my lab at Inca. First, I would like to uh, acknowledge this team that is doing a great work together. So all the results I'm going to show to you today, uh, it was them who put the hands uh, in, the, in the data and I analyzed the, all the data. Also, my collaborators, uh, Marcelo Mori and Pedro Moraes Vieira, both from uh, Unicamp University. And uh, the results I'm going to um, uh, share with you today, they are related to the study of uh, macrophages in the tumor microenvironment. And the reason why we got uh, interested in this subject is, be is because uh, the oncology field has benefited a lot in the last years regarding the advance in our knowledge uh, regarding the, the characterization of immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. And this has led to the development of new immune therapies, giving hope to many patients. But what we see is that there are still many, many patients that don't, do not reply to those uh, immune therapies. And there are many reasons why uh, they do not respond. But one of the reasons is associated with the presence of uh, myeloid derived cells with immune suppressive characteristics in the uh, tumor microenvironment. So these uh, myeloid uh, derived cells, they can either be uh, generated from uh, embryonic progenitors, also from uh, adult uh, progenitors, and once they are uh, in the tissue, in the niche where they are gonna uh, display their function, they receive several stimuli that uh, shape uh, the functions that they are gonna display there. So they are considered very plastic uh, cells. And um, when we are talking about these cells in the tumor microenvironment uh, context, uh, specifically now talking about macrophages, uh, they have been associated not only um, with the tumor uh, killing, like um, trying helping uh, other cells, other immune cells to kill the tumor cells, but they also have been associated with functions such as angiogenesis, uh, invasion, invasiveness and metastasis, 
they also have been shown to regulate other immune cells in the tumor microenvironment, leading to this uh, immune suppress suppression and fostering uh, the tumor growth. And they also have been related to therapeutic uh, resistance, as I've mentioned before, both uh, regarding to radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Uh, because they display macrophages, because they display so many different functions in the tumor uh, microenvironment, they have become a very interested, interesting cell uh, to use as a target, also to develop to develop new um, uh, interventions, new uh, immunotherapies. And although there is nowadays some initiatives uh, to block those cells or even to reprogramming those cells, uh, there is a lack in the current uh, literature regarding the specific um, markers that those cells, they display in their, um, yeah, that, th that those cells they display. And also uh, there is a lack of uh, our knowledge to understand how those cells specifically, uh, how they, what are their specific roles in the tumor microenvironment. So to try to tackle this issue, our group decided to study those cells in the tumor microenvironment. And uh, this strategy that we used was to retrieve um, public, uh, public available data. So we were able to uh, retrieve data from seven different solid tumors. We also used use some normal samples from the same tissue of orange. Uh, and those uh, data sets, they comprise data that came from uh, 100, 100 to 100. 142 donors and comprising more than 400,000 cells. Uh, we were able to come up with a bioinformatics pipeline to uh, nicely remove the batch effect associated with each study and to promote uh, uh, the clusterizations of cells according to their gene expression profile. So uh, by doing this, uh, we were able to get this nice collection of cells that came from 13 studies. And as you can see here, those uh, data sets, they were also um, generated using different technologies, these three technologies that I'm in Lucerne, I'm, that are depicted here in this image. And uh, you can also see that this um, pipeline was able to remove even the batch effect associated not only with the studies, but also with the different technologies. So after clusterizing up all the, those cells, we identified the main cell types in each cluster. And as you can see here, the uh, largest group of cells in the tumor microenvironment were the T cells. And the second one was uh, the myeloid derived cells subpopulations that are depicted here. Uh, regarding those cells, we were able to identify the neutrophils, also mast cells, monocytes, dendritic cells, and the macrophages using mainly the canonical markers that I'm showing here. Um, because of time today, I'm going to only talk about the microfates um, subpopulations characterization. And uh, my, those subpopulations, they were the largest one among the myeloid derived cells. And uh, we were able to identify one group of cells that were displaying uh, markers of residence, such as 4R2 and PLTP here, but we were also able to identify a large group here in purple that was expressing some markers related to monocytes. We call those cells as recruited macrophages. But very interestingly, interesting, we were able to identify this small group of cells that were displaying both 
uh, residents and recruiting markers. We call those cells as resident-like macrophages. Um, as expected, uh, most of the um, tumor samples, they were enriched in recruited cells, but this was not the case for even uh, for either uh, melanoma tumors, as you can see here, and also for UVL melanoma tumors, where more, most than 50% of cells of macrophages there, they have this um, resident uh, tissue uh, origin, let's say. Uh, the literature has uh, recently kind of characterized this um, receptor, TREM2, as an important marker of tumor-associated macrophages. And they also have shown that um, cells expressing this marker, they have this immune suppressive active leading to lymphocyte um, exhaustion. And it was very interesting because when we were evaluating TREM2 expression among the cells that we have characterized, we saw that not only recruited cells were able to express um, this marker, but we also saw that some resident subpopulations, they were also expressing high levels of TREM2. Uh, to further characterize uh, even uh, in a high resolution, those cells, uh, we split the resident tissue macrophages in four subpopulations. All the four subpopulations were expressing different markers, as I'm showing here, and the recruited uh, sub uh, the recruit recruited subpopulation we split it later in eight um, subpopulations that I'm also showing here. They were all also uh, expressing. Uh, different markers, justifying uh, the study of them separately. So here is just a over um, heat map to um, show how those cells they are they have these different gene pr program profiles. Um, curiously, uh, macrophages that were character that were actually expressing a signature similar to alveolar uh, macrophages that they were mainly found only in mainly found in normal samples whereas uh, this macrophage that I'm talking I'm going to talk more about them uh, later that were expressing um a hypoxia uh, signature was were mostly found on tumor samples but as you can see, all the other uh, subpopulations, they were either find in normal and tumor samples. So uh, very recently, I think two or three months ago, uh, these authors, they uh, come up with this review highlighting uh, the need of unifying the nomenclature of tumor associated uh, macrophage diversity. Since many studies, they are trying to characterize those cells in the tumor microenvironment, but each study is giving a certain name for those cells. And sometimes it's difficult to compare uh, if someone are talking about the same subpopulation or not. So by following this idea, we decided to see whether the 12 subpopulations that we have identified, if they were expressing signatures that has already been described in other um, works in the literature. So by doing this, we saw that this uh, subpopulation was expressing this pro-angiogenic signature with high levels of, uh, of, high levels of uh, gene expression of those genes, especially EREG, also this uh, VK and v VEGF alpha. Uh, we also saw that this other subpopulation that we called uh, hypomacrophages, they were expressing high levels of genes associated with hypoxia. Um, we identified two subpopulations expressing genes that were interferon-primed, 
And one of this subpopulation was a recruited macrophage and the other subpopulation was a, a resident tissue macrophage. And here I'm calling the attention for some chemosins that, and also this enzyme idle one they, that they were uh, highly expressing. Uh, we identified two subpopulations of macrophages associated with uh, lipid metabolism. Uh, one also from uh, also mainly found in resident tissues. Oh, not not found. Sorry. Also characterized as resident tissue macrophage uh, and a recruited subpopulation. They were expressing high levels of uh, APOE also fab fab P five. And curiously, curiously, we found this uh, macrophage that was uh, expressing genes from the antigen um, presenting uh, pathway, but also high levels of TGF beta and uh, genes from the IL10 uh, pathway, both um, anti inflammatory genes uh, in, together. Uh, we also identified uh, this subpopulation that was a resident tissue macrophage expressing high levels of metallotionins that are also associated with um, metal regulation in the tumor microenvironment. So by doing this, uh, as I mentioned, we were able to characterize these 12 subpopulations of macrophages in the tumor microenvironment that were expressing uh, a different set of genes and probably with different uh, functions in the tumor microenvironment. So to try to understand um, the main role of those subpopulations, we first uh, investigated if the any of the 12 uh, subpopulations, they were displaying uh, the well-known and characterized M1 or M2 signature. So the M1 signature associated with a more pro-inflammatory uh, activity, whereas the M2 signature is more associated with this anti-inflammatory um, profile. And as you can see here, uh, we saw a very mild difference between uh, the expression levels of, uh, of those subpopulations and showing that it was hard to characterize them as M1 or M2 um, subpopulations. In fact, if we take a deep look in the gene signature of M1 or M2, we can see that none of the subpopulations, they were expressing all those genes and even like in high amount. So showing that, uh, the characterization of tumor-associated macrophages in M1 or M2, it's a very hard task, task and that maybe we should um, characterize them differently. Uh, we also investigated uh, how those cells, they are being different, how they how they differentiate in the tissue. So as I mentioned before, those macrophages, they can have two kinds of um, progenitors, uh, the um, embryonic progenitors, but also the, the adult progen progenitors. And in this case would be the monocytes. So we investigated uh, how monocytes they could give an origin to those macrophages. And it, by using this pseudo time analysis, we were able to see that um, Monocytes, uh, once they are the progenitors of those recruited cells, uh, they started to differentiate. And here in yellow, I have the, the subpopulations that are more differentiated. So they have this higher pseudo time. And interestingly, two of the three most differentiated uh, subpopulations, they were the subpopulations that were expressing high levels of TREM2. So uh, we were also able to investigate genes that were um, modulating their expression while they were uh, differentiating into those uh, subpopulations. 
and we saw that genes such as ApoC1, Marco, CEP1, and also genes from the complement system, they were very important through this differentiation into this tumor-associated macrophage ex expressing high levels of TREM2. And this was in line with some finds in the literature where they also found those genes such as CEP1 and um, genes from the complement system as important genes from macrophages that express high levels of TREM2. Uh, we further uh, decided to uh, investigate the possible roles of those subpopulations that we have characterized. And for this, we first analyzed uh, angiogenesis signature for all the subpopulations. And as expected, both uh, this macrophage that we call an, uh, angiomacrophage and also the hypomacrophage, they were expressing high levels of this signature. Also this uh, resident tissue subpopulation. Uh, we also evaluated uh, the, 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 the potential of those cells to induce in that, uh, and promote an environment that foster tumor uh, invasiveness and metastasis. And in this case, we evaluated the extracellular matrix remodeling signature. And again, we saw uh, macrophages such as the associated with this hypoxia and angiogen signature as important uh, macrophages uh, leading this, this process in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, we also evaluated the score related to genes associated with the anti-gene presentation pathway. So in this case, uh, the macrophage uh, helping other, tum other immune cells in the tumor microenvironment to kill the tumor cells. And again, uh, this resident tissue macrophages, both associated with lipids and this uh, primed by interferon, uh, they were uh, the subpopulations that were expressing the high amounts of those genes. Uh, but interestingly, what we saw is that, is that some of those subpopulations, they, they were also expressing genes uh, that lead to an immune suppressive uh, tumor microenvironment. So in this case, expressing not only PD-1, but also the ligands of PD-1, so PDL2 and PDL1. And interesting, we saw that uh, this subpopulation, this uh, lipid associated macrophage that was expressing high levels of PD-1, was also the one that was expressing the higher levels of TREM2. So showing that even though sometimes those cells, uh, they have the, the capacity of doing the antigen uh, presentation and also stimulating other cells in the tumor microenvironment to list um, a, a cytotoxic uh, event, they are also displaying molecules that can lead to this immune suppressive uh, environment. Uh, last, we decided to investigate if any of those subpopulations, they could be related to some clinic, um, how can I say, clinic, um, if they could have some clinic impact from four patients. And uh, what we decided to do to answer this question was to analyze the presence of those subpopulations in a bigger cohort and then associate those, uh, those cells that, with uh, clinical parameters. So for these, we used this uh, deconvolution task, whether we where, where we predict in book RNA-seq samples the amount of each subpopulation that we have described by use as a reference matrix, the signature of this, the, the subpopulations that we have identified with single cell RNA-seq. Later, we associate uh, those cells subpopulations quantity 
uh, the, the amounts of those cells with the clinical parameters. So by doing this, uh, here I'm just showing you one example in over tumor, but we have profiled all uh, the tumor types that we were able to evaluate in our uh, single cell cohort. And in, in this case, in this example in ovarian cancer, actually high-grade serious ovarian cancer, we can see that uh, here each column represents one patient, and the colors, they reflect the amount of a, a cell type present in the, in the tumor microenvironment. So we can see that the patients, uh, the, the, they vary a lot regarding their tumor microenvironment profile with some samples uh, with a high amount of fibroblasts represented here in red. But you can also see a set here with a higher amount of this resident tissue uh, macrophage in green. So after doing this prediction in the book RNA-seq, as I said, we started to correlate the presence of those subpopulations with the clinical parameters. And in of what we saw in of, of our tumors specifically is that uh, macrophages associated, uh, those macrophages that I mentioned they were expressing uh, antigen presentation genes, but also genes uh, associated with an anti-inflammatory environment, such as TGF-beta-2 and CD86, they were enriched. They were found more uh, enriched in samples that were uh, in higher states. We saw the same pattern for this macrophage associated with angiogenesis. So uh, in in more advanced stages, uh, we found a, a higher amount of those macrophages. And we also identified that uh, these macrophages that were expressing molecules that are uh, responsible for recruiting other immune cells to the tumor microenvironment, they were depleted in samples of patients that were known responders to chemotherapy. Uh, we also analyzed uh, using a multi, uh, multivariate survival analysis, the individual in, and independent uh, clinical impact of those subpopulations. And also for ovarian tumors, we saw that uh, this resident tissue subpopulation that was expressing high levels of R2 uh, was uh, independently uh, associated with a, a poor prognosis uh, in ovarian tumor. So this is very interesting because now we can not only use this as a prognostic factor, but we can also think about uh, this subpopulation as a, um, a target for new uh, immunotherapies, at least for ovarian cancer. Uh, what we are doing now, we are trying to validate those results uh, using a cohort from INCA, in this case comprising patients from high-grade serious ovarian cancer. And uh, what we are doing, we are analyzing uh, immune chemistry uh, parameters. In this case, I'm showing here uh, in brown, um, actually in green, macrophages expressing uh, CD68, and in brown, uh, macrophages expressing uh, TREM2. And we are doing this analysis now to try to validate all the finds that we I have, I have shown to you today. So uh, the take-home message today is that uh, the tumor-associated macrophage phenotypes, they are very complex and it's very hard to uh, binary classify those states. Uh, rather, we have uh, a mixture of states that are a result of uh, different progenitors, also different niche where those macrophages, where they are localized. And this um, gives us a, a, 
an idea of how complex and those cells are, and also the need of identifying markers of each specific cell to later come up with new um, treatment options for the patients. So with that, I would, would like to thank uh, my team from the Bioinformatics and Computational Biology Lab at INCA. Also, uh, my collaborators from INCA, from Unicampi, my collaborators from UFSCI, and also all the funding agencies for this, their support. And also you all for the attention. So I, would be, I would be glad to, to take your questions if you may have. Great work, great example on how we can generate so much information using um, uh, data sets which are already available, right? Uh, we are running late here. We have a maybe time for one question. Uh, great presentation. Do you have a hypothesis around the metabolic differences between some macrophages, like lipid metabolism, for example? This is a, a very good question. And what we are seeing is that um, some of the uh, lipid associated macrophages, they sometimes are related to tumors where they can find uh, lipids around, such as breast cancer tumors. So this is very interesting because uh, we tend to think that they, all the macrophages, they are going to behave the same way regardless of the tumor, but we are showing that there are some specificities here. So this is very, very interesting. There are quite a few questions here for you. So if you could maybe address them directly in the chat because we have the next speaker already waiting here, but there are very interesting questions here for you. If you have some time to take a look at them, please. Okay. And thank you so much for joining us here today. Well, it's uh, my, my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Leonardo Collado Torres. Leonardo is an investigator at the Liver Institute for Brain Development. He has been in charge and he maintains several um, bioconductor packages uh, related to uh, single cell biology, including the spatial uh, LBD for spatial transcriptomic data. He is also a co-founder of the LIBD R Stats Club and the CDSB Mexico community, a community of bioinformatics software developers. Um, he has been, uh, of course, very active in the R and bioconductor uh, developing communities, in, especially in Latin America. And he is indeed part of the Bioconductor Community Advisory Board. So he will be talking about spatially resolved transcriptomic analysis with uh, an R Bioconductor uh, workflow and beyond. Leonardo, it's a pleasure to have you here. Please uh, feel welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Enrique, uh, and, um, and the Human Cell Atlas Latin America community for inviting me to present um, my work with you today. Um, but it's not only my work, it's also the work of Kerry Martinovich, Stephanie Hicks, and Kristen Maynard at the Liber Institute and Johns Hopkins. Um, so I'll be, um, um, earlier presentations were talking about like uh, single cell, and I'll be talking about uh, spatially resolved transcriptomics, which integrates single cell data, but then also expands it a bit more. Uh, so I, I posted the link to my slides on the chat, um, and you can also see them here on the first slide. Um, cool. So um, I work at the Liber Institute for Brain Development, and so it makes sense that we study the human brain. And in particular, um, there's one brain region called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that has been of interest um, to the Institute because of its association with uh, schizophrenia disorder and other uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and so we want to, to study that brain region in different ways. And we've used bulk RNA-seq, um, single cell or single nucleus RNA-seq. Um, and lately we've started to use spatial transcriptomics because it can give you um, an X and Y uh, mapping of where there is expression of different genes. And this can match to like, uh, different uh, cell type compositions over a particular brain region or even across brain regions. And it was named methods of the year. The, the method of the year in 2020 
Um, so it's still fairly new, um, and there's still a lot to 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 um, to figure out how to actually use this technology. And we started to uh, we did a pilot study using the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex because we we're like um, we're like okay, this is a new technology. Can it actually um, uh, does it actually work? Can we actually get what we already know? Um, and so we, we chose the dorsal, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, not only because of its um, biological implications with what we're interested in at the Institute, but also because it has a laminar pattern where it has um, um, six different um, laminar regions, plus um, there's a um, great, uh, sorry, the white matter also. So seven in total. And so there's been a lot of earlier studies ca characterizing how like the different cells um, are located in different um, of these layers um, and uh, how the density of the cells changes across the layers and uh, other things. Um, and so here we use um, spatial, but we've also been using single cell for, for uh, studying expression changes in, in the DLPFC. Um, they're highly related both, but like what uh, spatial uh, transcriptomics does, uh, in particular the Visium platform from 10x Genomics, it has, um, uh, you use a little square here that is 6.5 millimeters on each side. Um, there's around uh, 4,000 spots that are arranged in this honeycomb pattern. And each of those spots have uh, primers here. They have a spatial, uh, a spatial barcode, which will tell you like, oh, what spot did it came from? Um, then the rest of the technology for amplifying and sequencing is quite similar to the one from single cell, where in single cell view, you start with this, um, you have your gems uh, and uh, that you um, flow from one area and then the other ones you have your cells and you hope that you attach one cell per, uh, per, um, uh, per uh, gel over here, such that then you can, um, have a single cell in a particular um, with a particular bar barcode that you can then amplify and sequence. Um, so these are fairly related technologies. Now, our study design for this pilot uh, was uh, using only three different brain donors, so three different subjects. But we did two sets of spatially adjacent replicates uh, for each uh, donor. So imagine you have your loaf of bread and initially you take two slices of your loaf of bread. Then like later on in your loaf of bread, you take two adjacent slices. Um, and the idea is to see like, are they consistent across the slices or not? Um, and then also we, the dissection was done in such a way that we would have layer one, three, layer six, and also white matter. So we would have all um, seven um, layers. Um, um, and so here, like before you do anything to the tissue, you can have an expert here can say like, oh yes, I'm seeing layer one through layer six plus white matter. Um, that would not be me, that would be someone else. Um, then with the histology, um, you can also, they can also detect that uh, you are actually capturing the, um, the seven layers of interest. But then once we applied like a BZM and get gene expression measurements, we can look at, um, expression of a particular genes, for example, SNAP25. SNAP25 is a gene that is highly expressed in neurons, um, which uh, layers one to six are um, highly, in, um, have a higher density of neurons than white matter. So you can kind of see that it's like on everywhere except on this bottom left corner, whereas MOBP is a, is a gene that is highly expressed in um, uh, oligodendrocytes, which are um, much more common in the white matter than in the gray matter. And so that's why you see it over here on this bottom left corner. And it's almost like you could like take the two and then you get like um, the whole region. Uh, there's also uh, no marker genes for specific layers. So for example, PCP4 is a gene that is known to be expressed in layer five. And so you can kind of see um, this, uh, you can see here layer five, but it's also like a, a little bit expressed in some other layers. Um, so it's not like a perfect on versus off gene. Now, I mentioned that we have our spatially adjacent replicates. Um, and so here we can see that um, we have the different subjects across every row. And then we have our first set of uh, replicates 
as the first two columns and the next two set um, as the last two columns. And so there's a distance of 300 micrometers between the first and the last um, sample. Um, and um, it makes sense that like across that, uh, that distance, things will change. Uh, but within the specialization replicates, you can see that the patterns of expression are fairly similar. Um, um, as long as you don't have a mistake, I don't know, folding the tissue or things like that. Um, so this was like reassuring in some way because like all new technologies can have an, um, a certain amount of noise or, um, and um, uh, ideally we want to minimize as much technical noise so we can maximize the ability to, to study biological variability. Um, and so in order to, to do this analysis, uh, my colleague, Kristen Maynard, manually annotated using some known genes, all of these spots across the 12 museum samples we had um, into the different layers. Once you finish manually annotating uh, all of them, we then compress the data. And that's because spatial transcriptomics, just like single cell, is very sparse. So that means you have very small numbers, let's say counts of zero, one, two, three, four. That's not a um, uh, mathematically, that's not like a, a distribution that you can then use for some uh, statistics. So we need to get like a, a larger range of numbers. And the way you do that is we have the genes on the rows, the different spots on the columns categorized by their layers. Um, um, we sum up the expression um, values for all of the spots of a particular layer uh, for that particular gene. And so you go from a matrix that might have like, let's say around 4,000 columns per, for, for a single Bezium sample to a matrix that has only seven columns because we have seven layers here. You have the same number of genes. And so this little bulk ma uh, count matrix, you can do it for every single sample. And um, then we can look at, for example, principal component analysis of that sort of bulk matrix. And something that we saw here was that uh, you basically have principal component one separating the white matter versus all the other neuronal layers. And that makes sense because it's such a different um, 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 area of the DLPFC with different cell types. But then we saw like uh, actually on, on principal component two, we see that we start here in the bottom right with layer one, then two, three, four, five, and six. So it's kind of nice to see that progression across the layers. Um, so we were pretty happy at this point. Um, and so then, uh, um, you can start doing a lot of different statistics. Uh, one of, um, and you can do is a very general one is like the ANOVA model, which asks, is at least one of the seven uh, layers different from the rest? Um, and so uh, it might not be the most interesting one because in particular, white matter can be very different from the other layers. So at, at many genes will say, yes, there is a, <laughs> there is a statistically significant difference in at least one layer. You can repeat that analysis for let's say layers one through six, if you want to. Um, but the model that we have used the most is the enrichment model where you ask is at least what is a particular layer, does it have higher expression levels uh, than the rest of them? Um, so at this point you uh, combine the rest of them um, when you compare them against um, in this case, uh, white matter. Um, then the third one is can be useful when it's um, um, when you're looking at something that might be um, on in some layer, but like maybe off in its neighbor layer or some other one. And that's the pairwise model here, where you can you ignore the data for most of your layers and you only use the information from two, um, and then ask is layer X greater than layer Y. So we did all these different statistics, um, and in particular for the enrichment model here, um, there um, um, uh, these are the number of differentially expressions that we found uh, across each of the layers. Uh, it makes sense that white matter had the most signal again, um, and um, we then compared the the information of these genes against like known uh, known biology from mouse mostly. Um, and actually a lot of the mouse genes associated with these layers were not expressed in human. Um, um, so that is like also one of the challenges working um, with a, a well-studied, but maybe not a studied uh, brain region um, um, in the particular organism um, of interest. And so 
this, uh, what I just showed you is a bit of like the framework for analyzing spatial transatomics data that we have used. Um, but actually, in order to, to achieve this, we, we had to build some of the initial infra infrastructure for it. And we started with um, uh, a spatial experiment, which uh, uh, is a package for um, uh, storing this type of data and storing the images that you can then um, use across different analysis packages, simplifying the life of users by like just having like your data in one container instead of having to transfer your data across different containers of the data. Um, next, um, this goes beyond gene expression. You have images when you're analyzing uh, spatial transcriptomics data. And so uh, Matt Harvey Tippany uh, led uh, Vistoseg, which is um, a set of tools for um, working with the images and eventually uh, obtaining the number of nuclei that you have in each Vizium spawn. Um, and so this becomes a metric they can then use in your analysis. Um, uh, then um, another package we had to make was special LIBD, which um, is provides an, a way of interactively browsing your data. And it's, we needed to make it in order for, uh, uh, for Kristen to, to manually annotate the layers, but also for us to, to visualize the data that we had um, and uh, perform the statistical modeling. Um, so there's a lot of things that you need to build on. Um, and something that was kind of uh, nice that happened in the end was that we, we actually provided a framework for comparing clustering methods um, by providing um, a ground truth uh, of what we expect to see. Um, some clustering methods that you can apply that maybe are not spatially aware will give you clusters and you any method that, uh, for clustering will give you a result. But then the question is like, is this result something that, you know, makes sense or not? Is it what we would be uh, biologically looking for or not? Um, and so we generated many, many plots and we were always like asking ourselves like, eh, is it or is it not like what we're, um, like is it actually capturing the layers or is it capturing something else? Um, and so you can, you can refine these methods and the way here you can compare them against the ground truth is with this adjusted rent index metric where higher values are better. Um, and none of them here were like really good. Um, you want uh, the maximum value for ARI is one. And uh, you can see here, like none of them get that close. Um, but because we shared the data and like this framework for comparing things, actually well, a few months later, um, an, an independent group um, uh, uh, developed a method called base space, which is an especially aware clustering algorithm. And especially aware here means that like they know that like where the busy spots are and which are the neighbors. So they can use that information to smooth out the, the, the clustering results. Um, and so for example, here, this particular sample has an ARI of 0 0.55, which was a lot greater than anything we had uh, been able to do ourselves. So they even on their plot, on their paper, you can see like a similar box plot to the ones we had with array and like base space clearly being the best method here. Um, um, and I just wanna highlight how like uh, you share your data uh, uh, early on, you can accelerate science and you will uh, reap the benefits. So we have a preprint um, in February, 2020. Uh, a few months later, base space came out uh, and um, this acceleration wouldn't have been as the easy, uh, we had, if BaseBase had to wait until our paper got published, which was about a year later after a preprint. Um, and then we wouldn't have been, be, been able to know about BaseBase if you had to wait until like, let's say June, 2021 or even later. Um, so if you look at the dates here, um, it took us 346 days to publish our paper, them 271. If you had a fictional sequence, it would be a, around 620 days. Um, but actually, the, the real sequence from our preprint to their publication was 461, or even between preprints, 190 days. So you can see like how you know you basically save over a year of time, uh, depending how you know exactly you want to compare. You want to compare this 6, 617 versus the 190. Uh, but in any case. In reality, we, we, we definitely save at least 156 days by sharing the data early. 
Um, now, there's some caveats here with this ground truth, which um, even though like initially all the unsupervised results were very far from it, and we wanted to get closer to it, it doesn't mean that this ground truth is actually like the final truth, right? It's a guide um, um, of what we actually want, because uh, um, eventually it was uh, based on the manual annotation from Kristen Maynard, uh, which, I mean, she's an expert, but like uh, the, uh, the ground truth will, will move on uh, at some point. Um, uh, so it will evolve. So this is just a reminder that like, you wouldn't want to exactly get this result, the ground truth result. You want to get close to it, but not exactly that. Um, and so these methods have been help us, helpful to us because they can now help us scale up our projects. So a current project we're working on is using uh, also the VLPFC, but now across 10 donors um, where we're instead of three, but it, across each of these donors, we're now looking at anterior, middle, and posterior DLPFC because it's a pretty large brain region. We don't know if there's differences across them. Um, and uh, so we have a total of 30 BZM samples. Uh, we also generated some single nucleus RNA seq data for it. Um, but you could imagine, like, you don't want to manually annotate 30 samples. Um, so we use base space to, um, to spatially cluster. Uh, our data. Um, and here we have like results at different resolutions, for example, nine clusters, 16 or 28. Um, we like the nine version because if we compare our um, pilot data on the y axis against the nine clusters on the x axis, you can see that at least in every row and every column, there's a dark green square, which is um, what we were looking for in this type of plot. Um, uh, which compares uh, the two of the uh, sets of clusters. Um, um, so of course you can always refine it and maybe find like finer um, grain biology, um, finer detail, finer details uh, on these brain regions. You can always uh, subdivide them a bit more. Um, now software keeps evolving, and we are trying to stay as leaders in the field. There's uh, software in a lot of different uh, packet, uh, sorry, um, languages, programming languages. Um, um, but a lot of that software, people publish it and they have a nice paper about it, but that doesn't necessarily mean the software is like, uh, you know, really well done. Um, we need to, internally, we need to keep track of all the versions of software because it's, uh, um, it moves pretty fast. Versions can change quite drastically. And like, even for example, spatial experiment, which we were involved in, like a minor change, <laughs> can actually have a big change here. Like they made a small change and now like the data is completely flipped. Uh, so we had to update uh, some plotting functions based on that. Um, um, ideally you would say like, oh, this, you know, this paper has a nice software, let's use it. Um, but actually when you, once you start to use it, sometimes it can be hard to install. Sometimes it might um, not actually run their example analysis. So you need to communicate a lot with the authors of the, of the different uh, uh, pieces of software. We mostly use GitHub issues for that. And some people will respond fairly fast. Some people um, maybe don't respond as fast. And so over time that will tell you like what, are, what, what software should you actually use more than like, let's say what journal it was published on. Um, so uh, we also try to document our, our own software and um, test it and, and share it with others. So for example, we, we expand the special ABD to show how you can use it with, a, with a, any of the example data sets from 10X Genomics. And there's a very like, and it's a pretty long guide, but it explains everything you might need to know about it. Um, and so moving on, like, um, now that you have the ability to um, measure gene expression spatially, may let's you want to link it uh, with like what you knew already. And so, for example, you might have your lists of gene genes expressed, um, differentially expressed in a, a case control analysis, or like a GWAS or uh, TWAS or, um, or other created lists. Um, and so, something you can do is um, um, check for the enrichment of those genes across the genes that uh, mark the different layers. And so in our pilot study, um, we saw that for um, some um, autism spectrum disorder genes from different uh, studies, they were enriched for layer two and layer five, mostly a bit of six. And in particular, this newer study, 
uh, also replicated that those results from the Safari one from 2013. But that newer study breaks the 102 genes they have into two different sets, and those two different sets actually match the two different layers. So that was nice to see. Um, and you can you do it yourself uh, on the um, on the interactive websites we have. Um, now, um, these new technologies keep evolving. And so one new thing you can do now is if you can measure pathology with, sorry, identify pathology with some mark on it. So for example, in Alzheimer's disease, there are neurofibrillary layer tangles and amyloid plaques. Um, so if you can find them, uh, then you can uh, um, study the gene expression changes associated with the pathology that might be subtle changes. Like the, you, if you did like especially where clustering algorithm, you might not find them because they might be really fine grained. So this has to do with the idea of like, what are the top uh, variables that explain variability in gene expression? Uh, like the bigger ones are like brain region and then like cell types um, and then layers, uh, but like pathology is gonna be maybe more subtle. And so we have a pilot study that we're working on with San Ho Kwan, um, where we were using visium immunofluorescence to identify uh, where are the A beta plaques, where are the P tau tangles. Um, we actually needed Matt Havis help to improve VistaSec to handle this type of image data. But eventually what you get is like the proportion of, of a pathology signal um, in a particular spot. Uh, and once you have that, you can then identify or uh, which are the pathology free spots, um, the spots that have either one pathology, both, or the neighboring spots to some of the patholo pathological levels. Uh, so this is uh, work we're doing also with Samia Partivan, um, a PhD student. At, um, and so once you do that, you find like, okay, this is where the pathology is located spatially. Uh, you wouldn't, find this pattern with just spatial clustering. Um, it's too um, small um, in terms of uh, changes in gene expression. But now that, now that we've found it, you can do the same type of statistics that we did earlier. Uh, for example, the enrichment statistics. And here there's a gene, for example, RPN2, that seems to have higher expression in the next to A beta spots against the rest of the pathology spots. Um, and this one is maybe of interest because it's part of the uh, GWA genes for Alzheimer's disease. Um, some of them maybe in this case are depleted. Um, so they have, they seem to have lower expression. Uh, depletion in, in spatial transcriptomics is a bit challenging because of the sparse nature of the data. Uh, but that seems to be the more, more frequent case here in this pilot um, that we did. Um, so overall, if you're working with Visium, can be or spatial transcriptomics, it can be very powerful. Um, 10x has tried to make it open source friendly, and like we've definitely been involved with R and Biconductor, and making it even more uh, open source friendly. Um, but maybe the square that you work on can be too restrictive. So, for example, some brain regions we're studying are too big, so we need to cut it in four pieces and use four arrays to study it. Right now, maybe there'll be a larger um, capture area later on. Um, but if you want to work with like the, the latest um, data sets, you actually need to develop new software. Um, and we try to share as much as our as much as possible our data because we benefit from the software development other people um, uh, are able to do. Um, and for me in particular, it's fun to work uh, on a challenge where there's no answers on Google. Um, like um, um, that can be quite fun. Uh, it's also a bit scary, but it's fun because you know, like at least whatever solution you're you're providing is gonna be much better than what existed before. So some feature directions we want to finish this uh, proof of concept on visiting of fluorescence. Uh, we are working more on like integration with single nucleus RNA seq on LC, but also uh, that's locus Corellius. That's a different brain region, but also um, uh, the LPFC. Uh, we are interested in trying out Visium HD, which will be a larger um, capture area. Um, and there's still like a lot of questions because I'm, for example, trained on analyzing transcriptomic data, but not imaging data. And so at some point you wanna leverage that information even more. And we recognize that like, as we learn things ourselves, like we want to help other people learn what we know. 
And so right now we're also trying to work on completing a book um, on how to uh, analyze this type of data with bioconductor. So it's, um, um, it's available right now, um, but it's not complete yet. Um, and so this takes a work of many people. Um, and uh, in particular here, I wanna highlight uh, Stephanie Hicks from Hopkins, um, uh, Kristen Maynard and Kerry Martinovich from Lieber. Um, and um, yeah, this is a photo of us. Um, you can see me over there in the background. Um, and we're always hiring. And so uh, you know, I've done some anonymous team service that shows some good things, also some maybe bad things about our team. Um, you're free to check them out. Um, but if you're interested, um, we have open positions with either on the, uh, on the bed um, wet bench side or also the analysis side. So with that, uh, you know, thank you very much. Um, um, you know, we're happy to take any questions you might have. And um, if you want to talk more about in Spanish about data analysis, you can also join the um, CDSB Mexico Slack community. So oh, thank you. Thank you, Leonardo, for this wonderful talk. We are a little bit uh, tight on time, but we have a brief question from uh, Professor Claudia Rangel. Uh, on slide 10, you used the same test with different questions. So is the same test with different parameters? Is it? Yes. Um, so, um, the statistic behind the novel model is an F statistic. Um, um, the box plots are identical, yes. So it's the same data, but you can use it for, you can run different statistical models on it. So the, the um, on the ANOVA model, we're doing an F statistic, um, which asks as is one, is the mean of one of these groups significantly different than, um, than the rest of them. And it's like, at least the, <clears throat> sorry, it's, it's asking whether the mean of at least one group is statistically different from the rest. Um, the model over here is that we're doing a, a T statistic where we're comparing uh, the red um, points against all the blue ones. Um, and then the pairwise model is you ignore some of the data. So in this case, we're ignoring yeah. the data from layers one, two, four, five, and six, and only using the data from layer three and white matter to then do a pairwise T statistic. I actually have a recent YouTube video on like um, finding marker genes and like how the, all the different statistics can give you different results on that. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, it, it was in the color scheme. It, it was just that you went a little bit fast over it. Thank you, Leo. We, we're a little bit tight on time, but uh, the other questions that we have, we, we may, uh, driving this question to you so that you, you may uh, perhaps answer, answer uh, afterwards. Uh, but we have to move on because we are a little bit uh, tight on the schedule. Uh, thank you, uh, Leo. We really enjoyed your, your talk. Thank you. And now it's my time to present Professor Helder Nakaya. He was a professor at the University of Sao Paulo and a former deputy director of the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences there until 2020. Niwan. Then he became a senior researcher at the Hospital Israelita Albert Einstein, also in Sao Paulo. He's uh, also an adjunct professor at the Department of Pathology at Emory University School of Medicine in the US, an affiliate member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, and a principal investigator at the Center for Research in Inflammatory Diseases and at the Scientific Platform, uh, Platform Pasteur of the University of Sao Paulo. And Elder will be uh, talking uh, with us about using spatial transcriptomics to study immunology. It's a pleasure, as always, to have you here, Elder. Please feel welcome. Thank you so much, Enrique. And of course, thank you so much, the organizers, for inviting me here. It's a great opportunity to talk about single cell in this community. So let me share the screen really quickly. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, I'm really glad that Leonardo speak before me because he gave a, a very nice introduction about uh, spatial transcriptomics. And what I want to show is how we have been developing methods to study immunology using spatial transcriptomics. 
Okay, so I'm going to kind of accelerate these parts. It's very exciting moments in, in molecular biology because we can now take an organ and then take an image from this organ. And then we can get, uh, for each one of these single cells here, the, the spatial coordinates, X and Y coordinates of each single cell, extract the RNA from uh, them, or actually uh, actually label them or, or probe them to, to a area. And then we can get the spatial transcriptomics. Uh, and, and that's really cool because we have some projects. Carlos uh, in my lab has a project that he's looking at uh, tumor and inflammation, and of course, what sleep deprivation and change in the circadian rhythm can, uh, how can this affect uh, the, the, the tumor progression? And what this, how can we look at this at spatial transcriptomics? However, as Leonardo said, uh, this is a very brand new field. So we realized in order to do a proper analysis, we had to invent, develop new methods that, that do not exist. And, and of course, this is really challenging because you are kind of alone, but, I, but now I have some people that I want to contact, including Leonardo after this, uh, this talk. So uh, what usually people do in spatial transcriptomics is to have the, the two, two separate group of data. So you have the image data, and also you have the, the, the cell profiling data. And, and people usually use the, the expression profile of the single cells in order to uh, identify the cell types, okay? So that's, this has nothing to do with the spatial uh, position of the cell. It's just based on, on the profile of each cell. So they know what are the microphage, what are the oligodendrocytes, and what are the, the epithelial cells. And then what they do is to put back into the, the image so they will know now where the cell types are on each organ or, or each regions and, and how they communicate to each other. But our goal was different because uh, what we want to know actually is where a specific gene set is induced or is happening in the, the, the image. And why this is relevant? Well, because sometimes the same gene set, for example, let's say apoptosis, can be happening in different cell types. So it has nothing to do with the cell type, but has to do with, with the, the biology. And likewise, the, you, you may have the same cell type, let's say macrophage, but for this macrophage, some will, have, will, will be inducing uh, apoptosis and some will not. So if you separate the, 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 the cells by cell types first, you may lose this information. So our goal was to, try to enrich user gene sets and do a, a spatial enrichment gene set analysis so we can see where the, the biological process is happening in the, the image. And, and this is the acronym for SIGA, which uh, we realized we could not use because of uh, trademark properties. So we developed a new uh, uh, logo, which is SIGA, and you guys are gonna understand why there is this uh, icon here. Well, I hope that uh, these methods becomes one of the computational tools that we develop in our lab, mostly for bulk transcriptomics and systems biology. And uh, one example of the, the, project, the problem is if you look at this sample here, it's a lung, lung, lung cancer sample where you see the image here. And we also have the, the, the data set. So we have, uh, hundreds of genes, in a, imagine a table with hundreds of genes in rows and 100,000 columns where each column is a single cell. The first thing we can do is to select uh, uh, a gene set, let's say inflammatory genes, 36 genes. And then we can see how many of these uh, 36 genes are expressed or not in each one of these single cells. And then we can sum this information here, okay? When we put back to, to the image, we will have a kind of a heat map. So we will know which areas have more expression of our gene sets of interest. But heat map is kind of hard to work with because of this is kind of like shaded. It is hard to, to, to define boundaries. So we had the idea of transforming this into a landscape. So uh, let's use the counts of genes in a gene set as the heights and then make the, uh, a landscape from this, okay? When we do this, we can flood 
this uh, landscape and then identify the islands, which are the areas where you have more uh, expression of the gene sets of interest. But the problem is that if you do this for 36 genes and then you define a, a heights for the water level, and you do the same thing for a random gene sets, you're gonna see that there are some islands that are the same here, you see? These are usually the, the places where tumor cells, which are undifferentiated, that can differentiate to anything, probably are. So uh, we cannot use simply counting the number of genes in a gene set. We have to have a statistic uh, behind this. So we, we come up with the idea of using uh, Fisher exact test to, to calculate a p-value of how, how significant 22 genes out of 36 uh, is for this specific cell here, cell one. Same thing for cell two. And then we use the p-value as the height, which is now statistically uh, relevant, for creating this uh, landscape. The, the first problem is uh, how we are gonna define the water level, how we are gonna say uh, which water level is uh, good enough to, to define the islands. The other question is how can we uh, smooth the, the peaks in order to have the landscape? And that's a, a relevant question. If, if you imagine 100,000 cells, this would be the equivalent of having, for example, uh, a woods, and then you have 100,000 nails where you have different heights. So this move would be like a, which kind of cloth, panel cloth, you would put on top of these uh, uh, nails. Would be like a, a made of silk, made of uh, uh, cardboard or something more uh, thick, you know? So that's gonna affect the, the landscape and also it's gonna affect which p-value or which water level you're gonna use. So we start playing around and then we use, for example, the genes that were markers of exhausted T cells. Exhausted CD8 T cells are important because our immune system is constantly fighting against tumor. And sometimes they get exhausted of fighting and that's when usually the, the, the cancer uh, expands. So we, we identify the islands related to exhausted CD8 T cells. And then we did the same thing for the effector CD8 T cells. These are the cells that fight the tumor that are like active. And then we did the same thing for the, the, the islands of genes related to cell proliferation. And then we know where they are, each island is. And then we can navigate on these islands, for example, to see uh, what are the compositions of the islands. So we can see like how many CD8, tumor, T-Rex are on each one of these uh, islands, and then understand more of what's going on on a specific uh, area. Or we can compare the distance of the islands. So for example, we can just uh, transform this into a 2D. Now you see that these islands here becomes this 2D graphs. And then you can just merge this. For example, you, we can look at wh what is the distance between exhausted CD80 cells and cell proliferations. And then we can calculate a matrix of distance or where each island of the cell proliferation is in the rows and each island of exhausted T cells are in the columns. We can do the same thing for effector CD80 cells. And then we can just merge this and then calculate the distance between the islands. And that's gonna be the, this matrix here. But it, do you agree that it's very hard for us to, to analyze uh, a matrix like this? What we can do is, because our question is how far exhausting and effector T cells are from the cell proliferation islands, we can calculate the minimum distance of each row here. And then we can see if each row, uh, each island related to tumors are actually closer to exhausted CD80 cells or uh, effector CD80 cells. So that's exactly what we saw, you see? It's closer to exhausted T cells and uh, effector T cells. And because of uh, we start like, uh, uh, there is another uh, way of renaming this program, which is Archipelago. So I would like you guys to, to give me your opinion on which ones we should use for this uh, program that we are planning to submit soon. But uh, Archipelago could be a nice uh, logo, right? Well, let's switch to, to single cell uh, of transcription of the mouse brain. And Leonardo already gave a nice introduction of why it's important to analyze the brain. 
It's because there is not only neurons there, you have different cell types, but people don't know where the cell types are located or are there subsets that are related to the locations or how do they communicate with your organs or which genes are activated on each region. So all these questions can be answered with spatial transcriptomics. And we use a data set called MERFISH, which is different than uh, vision because you can see not only at single cell level, you can see at single uh, molecule. So it's a in situ hybridization where you can see where the transcript is inside the cell. And that's a very powerful technique. So this is already the image of the manuscript that uh, we are uh, finishing, where we have three sections of the mouse brain. And the first problem that we had is how can we compare with what we know about the, the mouse brain? If you look at the textbook, there are hundreds of areas, regions described for the mouse brain. And then if you try to overlap what the, the textbook into the, the real expression data, you see that each dot here, gray dot is a single cell. You will see that you're gonna miss some regions because uh, this is uh, the real experiment is not a textbook uh, uh, image. So if you try to overlap, it's gonna fail. How can we solve this problem? Well, to solve this problem, we had to look at the sky. We realized that astronomers have the same problem, but instead of looking at single cells, they are looking at single stars, look, comparing stars. So we just repositioning a tool used by astronomer to analyze single cell uh, transcriptomics. And then when we do this elastic transformation methods, we can now correct for this problem. And now we know exactly what are the regions that are in the real data. And once we do this, we can follow with the standard procedure, which is, uh, annotating the, which cell types are these 700,000 single cells. And then we can put back in spatially to see where they are. You see that some uh, neurons are actually spatially located. And that is interesting because if you uh, select only the neurons and then cluster them again, you're gonna see that there are two, uh, several major clusters, the inhibitory, uh, excitatory uh, neurons, and then you can subcluster them. So you can identify 22 clusters of neurons. And when you put back to the brain, you are gonna see so wonderful that some neurons are very specifically located. For example, the cluster three is only located in this region here, you see? And when you look at the, the, the markers, this is uh, reveal some interesting biology. We can also look at uh, uh, the transcript level. We can see exactly where the transcripts are located in the, the brain. And we can make animations such as this one where you can zoom in and then you can uh, uh, see where the, the genes are. You can turn off or turn on one of the genes just to really see what's going on. And uh, the last method that we have to develop is this one. Uh, because we, we have the, the boundary of the cells provided by the Murphy's company, we can define where, where is the, the center of the cell. Where is the, the center of the cells compared to the nucleus and membrane? And then we can look at where uh, a transcript is located uh, uh, inside the cells. And we do this for the same gene, but now looking at thousands of transcripts. And then we can quantify this and that's become the transcript flow. We can look at where the transcripts are or concentrated inside the cells. And when we do this, we, find, we found that uh, some transcripts, some genes were actually located in specific regions in the cells, right outside the nucleus, close to the, to the cytoplasm, and some are inside the nucleus, but not homogeneously inside the nucleus, but it's specifically located, for example, in this, in this case, in the top corner, right corner of the, the nucleus. Uh, as a conclusion, I would like to say that uh, we are also working with uh, single cell uh, data. So we have uh, now uh, single cell transcriptomics of Leishmaniasis patients where we have skin and blood and we, we are analyzing. But I think that the take home message here is that uh, we have to unite among ourselves and really try to, to work with uh, public available data, developing methods, exchange ideas, and you guys are going to see that there are some uh, WhatsApp groups that are going to be uh, made specifically for Latin American. And uh, I do want also to, to participate. And if you guys want to join our uh, groups as well, to we think that it's very easy to train someone. 
but it's very hard to talk about real science in the application. So these are the people that work with SIGA or Archipelago, Transcript Flow and the, the, the cancer projects. And this is the whole team of uh, our lab. So thank you so much. Thank you, Elder, for this uh, wonderful talk. Actually, very clear, very specific questions that we uh, no doubt uh, found uh, out some of these technical challenges. So it's, it's, it's great to, uh, as in Leonardo's talk, to, to have an idea of what are the main challenges that, that, that we may be finding. Uh, I, I had forgotten, but I have also to thank uh, the, the team of interpreters because we are having this um, now multilingual uh, presentation. So it's, it's uh, also a great uh, work that they have been doing. And uh, we have a question uh, for Elder. How does, do, do you think that this tool complements the current, uh, the existing tools for spatial analysis? What, what's the what's the role of this of this new tool? Yes, uh, we we have been comparing our tools, uh, the the ones that we are developing now with the the current existing one. Giotto is one of the one of them. So uh, the benchmark is going to be like a a process, but uh, we haven't found a tool that generates uh, what we need, which is a transcript flow and the, the the archipelago, the way we want. So uh, in some manner it complements uh, what people are, are doing thank you elder we 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 are we will be looking uh, for for your your current and, and future developments on, on this uh, really interesting um problem and and also how how to introduce ideas like this astronomy idea of the stars on the on the issue of perspective uh on, on, on how to, to to add spatial perspective to to these transcriptomics so thank you uh elder thank we you so much been, Eric. we have been going to a really wonderful uh session this uh, morning we will be having a, a lunch break or or a coffee break depending on your time zone and we will be back here within uh the next hour so in, in one hour we will resume uh, in this uh, same uh channel and we will be having the uh, a very interesting talk from the HCA data platform. So if you want to get a good idea of how to manage this uh, data on a, on a more uh, productive way, that would be an, an awesome talk. We will be also having the lightning talks and the breakout sessions. So see you within one hour and enjoy uh, our brief uh, break. Thank you uh, to all of you.